Here. <laughs> Mr. Rakes? Here. Ms. Garrison? Here. So before we get started on uh, the first action item of the agenda, I did want to say a special thank you to Mr. Rickus, who has um, transferred the chair of this fine committee to myself, but I've um, been thinking those are very large loafers to fill for the next <laughs> whatever period. Um, so thank you, Richard, for serving this committee so well as you do the board, and I hope I can come a little bit close. Um, with all of your support. So. I know we're in great hands. <laughs> well, that was my, I was fishing for that compliment. <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna start with our first action item being the minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of the April 20th, 2015 Board Finance Committee meeting, which was in your board packet? Um, any corrections, with any corrections and additions? I move we approve the minutes. I second. Okay. Roll call. Ms. Chow? Yes. Mr. Rakes? Yes. Ms. Garrison? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to move into the other three action items and then our discussion items. Mm -hmm. And so first up, we have um, <coughs> our action item of the Food Service Satellite Meals Program contract. Um, I think, Jordan, you're going to lead us, sure. start off, and then we'll ask any questions, have any discussion before sure. we take a motion. Um, okay, so this is, I believe, the 16th or 17th year of this contract uh, with ETHS. Um, you might want to speak into the mic. Oh, sorry. Thank you. And uh, this year's uh, increase is uh, proposed at $1.72, which is a, uh, just over 1% higher than last year. Um, and significant, uh, well, let me go back. The projected number of meals for next year is right around 300,000, so the total cost of the contract would be um, 518,000 for next year, as an estimate. Um, significant provisions for next year. Uh, probably the biggest one, we implemented this a couple of years ago, but as far as the commodity sharing goes, um, any amount of commodities shared over um, the what we're required to share per meal is uh, credited back to the district. And as of the end of April, we are at a $20,000 credit with ETHS, which will come off the bill at the end of the year. So like I said, that was implemented a couple of years ago, whereas we anything um, over, we were not receiving back. So that has been a nice addition to the contract. Um, as far as um, I, last year, I, and I don't remember who, I'm sorry, but one board member had asked about sort of tracking any um, issues we had with the contract throughout the year. So I did include a spreadsheet for this year uh, with that. Um, and it, I won't say it's everything that comes up, but it's the, it, it is the big, the big problems that occurred. Um, just so you could see what that looked like. Um, and, and no significant changes um, with the menu. We'll continue to offer the fruit and vegetable carts, which are, uh, allow us the opportunity to um, offer five or six fruits and vegetables every day. Uh, we're gonna continue with uh, three lunch items every day that the, the kids get to choose from. So no significant changes as far as the menu in that sense. And just to clarify, is the the increase a dollar seventy two no. the or the two total cents. amount is the total okay. amount. So the total Sorry. amount is dollar yes. seventy two. Two cents is the sure increase. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so with that, let's um, open it up to questions or comments that anybody I has. Just, yeah, I had one quick question. Um, just could you clarify your definition of commodities? Because mm -hmm. I think of it quite different, I think, than you're using it here. Uh, what are commodities? <laughs> yeah, so the district, based on the number of meals that we serve in the previous year, the district's allotted a certain amount of money, um, and that varies every year. Um, I think it's based on the CPI in the end. But um, So we're allotted a certain amount of money to be used in different ways um, to reprocess goods, to order what's called brown box, so it's um, 
foods just from the state and they're um, like canned goods or uh, a lot less processed goods. And then also the money can be used and we use over 50% um, in something called the DOD Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. So we can order uh, through a contracted vendor exactly that fresh fruits and vegetables. So we use a little over 50%. Uh, which is what the state allows us uh, for that, and then the rest in the uh, reprocessed and brown folks goods. And so they order, they they use our money to subsidize uh, those meals that go to our, our children. Hmm. Okay. Um, on page six of the agenda packet, which is looks like it's almost the first page of your report, mm -hmm. and you have these bullet points, and I was just sure. a little bit confused by, it says, as of the April 30th, District 65 has a 21,000 uh, credit? Mm -hmm. Dollar credit, yes. Okay, yeah, okay. So we have, basically, we have shared $20,000 more in commodities than, than, uh, so there's a per meal amount of commodities that you're supposed to use. We've, tw we've shared $20,000 more than that, so they will credit our last bill with that money. So that's a good thing? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. it's a very good thing. And it, it basically, it, before that, we were, we, were always go we were always sharing more, but we weren't getting any kind of credit for that, so it was a disservice to the district. Other questions? I, well, I just had one last comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I found the, the, pro the problems. I don't think I was the one that asked for it, but I found these problems pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it, out of context, I, I will say it does, it does see, it's a little bit startling to see all those problems. I don't know that it's all that uncommon to have that number of problems in a mm. food, service, food service operation. And I will say it has been much better this year than in the previous two years when we were offering two hot entrees versus uh, one hot and two cold. I think that just proved to be a little bit more difficult for the high school given when they get our lunch mm -hmm. count information. So you would say on, on the things that you highlighted as um, effective provision, which is on page six and seven, mm -hmm. timely preparation, accuracy of plan menu, all those things that they're doing very well on all those measures? Pretty well. I mean, I do think there's some room for improvement, but um, it's, it is better than it was the previous year, which was a real concern in the year before. Any cause for concern still? Uh, no, I think the biggest problem, especially at the school level, was getting the food there on time. And like I said, I think that had to do with the two hot entrees. They were really struggling to get both out um, on time. And so we haven't really had trouble with um, getting the food to the schools on time, which is hard on the schools. Thank you. And Jordan, can you walk through some of um, the details about, you know, which of our buildings can provide their own lunches and then why we supplement from the high school and? Uh, yeah, so the three middle schools and King Lab all do have their own kitchen, so we staff those um, and, and they do cook from them. Um, King Arts gets a little bit of help from Shoot, but it's all within the district for there. And then Park is actually provided for by Nichols. Um, so, so like I said, they, they are able to provide their own food, which is awesome. But in all of the elementary schools in Bessie Roads, we do not have any, um, anything to call a kitchen, <laughs> some sinks and a steam table. So that food is required to come from another place, whatever that may look like. And then can you go through how lunches are ordered and when they're ordered and that sort of sure. process? Uh, so right now we use the student uh, database or the student information system. Uh, we have just a form that's on there daily for each of the teachers that uh, displays what today's menu is and the students go through or the teacher goes through. It's different at every school. It's even different by teachers what that system looks like, but essentially they, uh, they plug in how many, you know, um, of each of the meals, including milk, that, that classroom will be receiving. And then the food service um, employee at each school collects all of that information and orders uh, with, uh, from ETHS with it. 
And how long does that take for teachers to handle the um, order process? So I called process? like three principals today, mm -hmm. and it ranged between uh, it should uh, it better not take more than two minutes to um, five minutes. So. And what if we didn't order? What if we just got a standard allotment every day? What what would the uh, what what would have what would need to happen is we would have to order a lot of extra food from ETHS in order in order to cover variances. Even with the current ordering system, which is done the day of, we do order extra because there's late buses and sick kids, and so we order extra um, already. But it would have to be significantly more in order to cover in, in order to cover that. Students are fairly predictable, but with so many different options, they do change, which we want them to. That's why we offer a variety. They do order different things on any given on any given day, so. And what, which of our schools have uh, breakfast programs? We have, I think, 10 schools with breakfast, so it might be easier to say who doesn't. Um, Haven doesn't, I thought I printed this. Haven, Orrington. Just a second. I looked at them. You have them? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> it's Haven, Willard, Lincolnwood, Dewey, and Orrington. Yeah. That and Rhodes right. is a question mark. It's listed in one place and not in another. Rhodes started the year offering um, breakfast, uh, but it was not at all successful. So, and I, and I will say, we don't have, we're standing at about 7% participation across the district in breakfast, which is, um, not great at all. We have much more opportunity for that. I, and I have met with um, actually a really great group recently. Um, it's called uh, Rise and Shine Illinois. It's through, uh, I think, Hunger, the Depository. Food yeah. It's, it's, anyway, I've met with them um, about alternative breakfast options, um, which I have been really interested in for several years. Uh, like grab and go in the classroom um, in order to increase participation. Um, it's just been one of those things that hasn't necessarily sparked a lot of interest, I think, at the school level yet. But it, you know, I'm willing to dig deeper with um, that group. Isn't support. it um, Dewey that's doing the books and breakfast? Books and breakfast. They do and books and breakfast, and that is outside of the district. Right. So they're they're receiving funding in a, in another. Do you know what level of participation they have with that? That's a good I do not. Higher than I, I think we should talk about talking to books and breakfast and seeing how we can either partner with them or bring it to more more schools because they are amazing and they're doing great things because they're coupling academic support with breakfast which is a great combination right so it'd be neat if we could get involved and right. see how we could support them and roll it out at other schools i think there's some discussion this year for lincolnwood we, yeah that's right. their and next i think we have them pending either our next board meeting or the following one and we're, we're waiting to confirm yeah they're writing their strategic plan this right. weekend and so they wanted to delay a little bit but i sure even if you wanted to have some sure I know the biggest issue is the busing in that the bus buses tend to get there so late that coming to the cafeteria to get breakfast is is the the hurdle and so unless you're coming to school early for something like books and breakfast they're, they're you're missing out on the opportunity so yes yeah. definitely and there are um, there are schools in other districts like that are in rise and shine nationally that are doing breakfast to go yes at the end of the day where yes. you have a piece of fruit and some like dry cereal or a breakfast bar and it's in a grab and go bag mm -hmm. so that a child can take it home with them right yeah there are a lot of really good models Richard a uh, couple questions. The seven percent is seven percent of what? Of uh, eligible, so of the enrollment. Of the total student enrollment, mm -hmm. and does that in those schools? In those schools, right. sure. Does that take into account the students that eat breakfast in child care programs? No, because that's probably another at least two, three hundred kids who who eat in child care um, because or at least have of access to it. Right, um, right. I don't know what the numbers actually are, given that we're not in 
some five schools, maybe it's much smaller than that. But it's, it's go going to increase the 7% by some number. Right, right. Yeah, I think it is an issue of being there. I think more students would participate if, if they were there or if it was, you know, if you were able to eat in the classroom, something along that line. But the five minute to get to the cafeteria and eat and throw away your food is really the hurdle. The, the only reason I raise that is, you know, if we're looking at trying to have sort of percentage growth, yeah. which I'm hearing as a goal that we haven't necessarily explicitly said. Yeah. We would want to just count those students Most again as our baseline percentage. Because they're, it's going to be either or. Would yeah. we also want to count, not count in the students who aren't eligible? Because if you're doing the whole population. Well, all students are eligible. So any student, any not students? just free and reduced lunch? Yeah. Just like lunch. It's not just for free and reduced lunch. <laughs> so but she's saying eligible meaning you can buy it. Right. Buy it. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah you, would, you would buy it, correct, for if you were not free or reduced. It's $2. And just to clarify, students who are free and reduced lunch eligible are free and reduced breakfast correct. eligible as correct. well. Correct. And they're not, they're not overly identified. So if I was going through the lunch as a free student, the person coming behind me, we don't have anything different. So we can't trace... We don't have data that say of the students who are on free and reduced lunch, how many are actually partaking? Yes. We do. Yes. It's by just, by status, it's just done in the computer so that right. nobody yeah. ever knows. And one last thing, you know, with the concern of food allergies, um, can you tell us what um, precautions are taken in the lunchroom with peanut butter being served, and why we don't just use soy butter products? Right. Um, so we started actually just, this is the first year for peanut butter and jelly. Um, and it sort of came about in the previous year doing site <coughs> observations and realizing that the vast majority of home packed lunches were peanut butter and jelly. So it should be, no, the district doesn't have a policy, you know, preventing that. And I wouldn't recommend them either. Um, and so sort of in my role saying, you know, my job is, to prevent or to provide a variety of nutritious and, you know, uh, options for the students. And if this is something that they're going to eat, let's see. Um, and so it, it has been uh, fairly popular. It's about 200 to 400 um, meals a day. And we do order that into the district prepackaged so that we don't have a risk of cross-contamination within the, within the kitchen um, to, to our other food items. So it has been, I had, um, I think, one parent and one teacher call in the beginning of the year. But um, outside of that, I haven't had any um, concern. And our with tables are set for Correct. peanut free versus Correct. peanut Correct. engaged. Correct. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not even <laughs> peanut. It's any kind of allergy. I mean, we have an, an allergen-free table. <laughs> Or, or everyone else. We, for those children who have severe allergies, <laughs> yes. uh, kidding aside, the, we're, we're able to make sure that they're at a safe table and yes. there's no interaction with the foods that they may be allergic to. Correct. And my department also offers what's called a safe meals program. So we, we don't have that many children that participate, but um, those are for students who would like to eat school lunch but can't due to XYZ allergies. And we actually work with the parents and the students to provide um, a menu that's specific to them and, and meets their um, restrictions. So we have three students that, that, that take part in that for now. But it's open to anyone. Anybody else? Jennifer, do you have any questions? Yeah, I just I have one final question, and it's just being new and naive, and that is, since 1996, has there ever been any discussion about opening it up for a bid from other vendors? And um, sure, I, I can't speak to necessarily before I was here four well, years ago. I've been here nine years, and it has not it has not come up. You know, we've we try to um, engage cooperatively with the high school, and they are very conveniently located. Uh, we have the same district boundary, so it it has been um, a very positive relationship. Um, and aids in our collaboration. Um, the only thing I will say, I, it's something that 
outside of the board, I do I have looked at just before in you know doing my due diligence. But um, what I have found um, are that the foods that are being served it, there's there's a few companies that I feel like talk a pretty good game but when you really investigate what they're serving it, it doesn't seem to be at quite the variety especially when it comes to fruits and vegetables that we're able to serve um, and we also have a lot of um, say in the menu uh, with ETHS I mean I work directly with their director to come up with the menu or to make menu changes or you know can we do this differently and so I think those sorts of um, less tangible things that have really worked in the district's benefit, um, like with regards to the commodities but even. I think it's an interesting question. And then sure. we'd have to have some parameters, quality, right. cost, right. accessibility, right. Um, and the ability to be nimble. And that because yes. you know, if, the, if we have a field trip, if we've got um, some specialized needs in a school that day, and a kitchen, let's just say we find a, a competitor that meets all these needs, but the kitchen is 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. That becomes part of the equation that we would have mm -hmm. to consider. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can look at that. I think yeah, we're, most definitely. that said, we're, from what I hear and from what I know, I, we're satisfied with the high school and we like partnering with them. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thank most you. Definitely. Anybody else over here? No? Okay. Um, so, I think the only summary I would take away here is, is there was a fair amount of discussion about looking at other opportunities to increase participation of breakfast. Sure. Yep. I would get us, well, I'll add my own opinion here, maybe knowing the percent of free and reduced lunch, because I think our goal may be increasing percentage of free and reduced lunch students mm -hmm. that are participating as a priority over just the universe at large as a first priority. Does that seem fair to Absolutely. everyone? Mm -hmm. So specifically opportunities <clears throat> around that, mm -hmm. and then maybe in the future we can come back to it. Yeah. Can, and may I add one more? The, the, the difficulty of when a bus arrives late and a child hasn't gotten his or her breakfast, if they're, we should be thinking creatively about you know, grab and go or the yeah, ability to- Yeah, the options to, are there. To, those options are there, so how do we do that? So just because the bus is late doesn't mean that right. the child should be denied the, right. that right. first meal. Right. Right. You know, Candace, just to build off what you were saying, I think that it's the right idea, mm -hmm. and I think you saw everyone nod uh, with your comment. And it might be useful to understand how many of those families are interested, mm -hmm. right? So we, we're not necessarily aiming for 100% because right. maybe 100% don't want it, but should is our target population 60% who are interested, and so we need to go from 7 to 60 or whatever the number may be. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how we go about determining what that target would be, but I think we should find out somehow what range we might be looking at. Well, and we're looking at if it's, if it's proportionate. I mean, first we need to understand of the 7%, is that 40%, is it proportionate to the, the population of free reduced lunch in the large population, or is it much higher already? You know, so knowing that would be helpful, and then setting a goal from there, yeah, which you of probably already. What percent already of the free and reduced yeah. lunch? Right. Yes. Right. So, okay. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, in terms of the actual motion, um, the board finance committee recommends that the food service satellite meals program contract for fiscal year 16 be presented to the full board on May 18th, 2015. So here we're simply moving, uh, recommending this to the full board for vote. Roll so vote. moved. Or did we already do that? No, we didn't. We didn't. Okay. I second. Yes. 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 I decided to conform to the current Got it. method of doing things and not change things too much in my first meeting through. <laughs> <laughs> Power grab. I will listen <laughs> and learn. Okay, so um, next up is the technology software expenditure update. Um, Can I? Joe, Joe, sure. May I frame for a minute and then yep. uh, it looks like Mary will, will help me out as well. Just a, a context and a reminder context that this conversation came up during <coughs> our conversation about technology writ large and during our conversation about technology writ large as it relates to being um, uh, as, uh, as part of our 
basically our capital expenditures as opposed to our operating expenditures. And so that, that's the broader piece. In this, several board members said, to what ex before we move forward on the subscriptions, can we get some input as quickly as possible on um, what's being used and what's not being used? And so that's what this is. What, what this conversation isn't, but what we're excited about is a strategic planning process that we're gonna carry on through the next year where we're gonna be looking at um, not only the what of technology, but the how of technology and the what else of technology um, that we should be paying attention to in the district. And so that's, that's, uh, that, that's coming over the next year. It's, it's a process that has been engaged at the curriculum and instruction side to really think about where we're going from our strategic plan, what our curricular and instructional directions are, and then how technology supports and provides assistance. So that's coming soon, and this is in response to earlier conversation. Right. Mary, did you? Um, no, I was just uh, gonna say Joe Caravello has prepared a, a slideshow to walk us through and is prepared to field questions, but um, I know they did a lot of work in including engaging um, staff in a survey to, to really kind of um, get share some information with us so thank you Joe and just one other point since I didn't say this up front for folks who are here in the audience um, if at any time you want to join the conversation we're taking questions along with the agenda items so if I hope you didn't have any questions about food service no okay <laughs> but if you do about this about this agenda item um, we can do that when we get to the question portion good evening everybody um, as Dr. Gorn was saying, we um, back in February, the this committee decided to. Joe, we can't hear you. You can't hear me. No. Hello. All right. Back in February, we decided to um, do a survey of all the teachers to see is, is hardware used in, cl in the classroom and um, what kind of software um, is being used and if they're using it. So we, the goal of the survey was to determine the classroom utilization of hardware and online software subscriptions. And it's a starting point for questions on our planning process as we go on for our tech plan. The survey was on hardware and online instructional software. It was a multiple choice and open response. The survey was open for one week. It was to all teaching staff and about 33% of all teaching staff answered the survey. This is mostly elementary teachers that answered it, almost, uh, well, a little over 70%. Then the middle school and then specialists also answered the survey. And this is just a breakdown, and this is in your packet, of which teachers and what subjects they teach. And you can see that most of them over half of them, well, a little less than half, were uh, elementary school teachers. It was mostly focused on the databases and the use of structural technology hardware. You know, some of the caveats here is we had a low response rate, and the way the questions were um, designed to was really just for classroom teachers, the core classroom instruction, but we had many more responses as far as um, specialists, librarians, and other teaching staff. So to get the data we really wanted, um, it was a little harder to do than just straight classroom teachers. So one of some of the reasons the data is skewed is Read 180 is only for a small group of uh, teachers and students. Hapara is a teacher tool that's only used by the middle schools. EDM online is only used in K through five classrooms. Teaching books is um, primarily used by librarians. Synergize is, was just rolled out a couple months ago as far as the teaching tool and the PD for um, at Google and Google Apps. And News ELA is being piloted at Willard. So this is gets into your uh, survey as in your packet. Brain pop was kind of the most used of the databases with Discovery and um, Worldbook, the top three. Oh, this is the one for, uh, okay, this is shows, the first slide was 
the 151 teachers. This slide is for everyone. So the 151 was just classroom core teachers. This is this slide, and then this one shows all the teachers. As you can see, like, for example, like, read 180, it's just a small amount of teachers right there, and if you went to the slide before this, it's no teachers at all on this slide. One of the questions was, how critical is the database to your um, teaching, everyday teaching? And you can see that BrainPop and Discovery and Worldbook is still the top three. We have some here like um, Maps 101, Searcy Discover, and NetTracker had had really low response rates as far as them using them. And as far as the databases and um, what's most valued to the teachers, again, I'm sorry, you have BrainPop, Discovery, and also um, Worldbook. So it's, they're pretty steady as far as, you know, the same answers as far as the top three. Some of the barriers as far as the teachers um, using the software is, um, let's see here, is the PD. They're never, they really don't know how to use it. Some of them didn't even know it was there. And um, device availability as far as um, getting devices actually to use the software. Now getting into the hardware piece of it, as you can see, the document camera, the projector, and the um, Chromebook, MacBook, or iPad, they all have a good high rate of use. Of use. Um, the student desktop is a little lower because it's only in elementary schools. There's one desktop per classroom, not in the middle schools. That's why there's a lower rate on that. But you can see they usually use a daily, a few times a week, or a few times a month. Some of the barriers that um, the teachers were saying is, of course, lack of PD, not enough devices in the buildings, mobile carts always checked out, and some functionality issues. I did this other slide just to show you. This is um, all the teachers. This is just middle school teachers. And then you can see here, this is where we switched out all the MacBooks with the Chromebooks, and the functionality issues dropped down a bit here. It went from almost, you know, what's that, 31%? to just a little bit over 8%. So some of the surveys, uh, insights for the hardware is um, it's high utilization rates for most hardware, over 70%. Some of the barriers, of course, is the lack of availability due to assessments, usage bottlenecks, the lack of devices, intermittent, intermittent failure to of older equipment. And schools that have converted to Chromebooks show a lower rate of failure, including break, fix, logins, and networked issues. Did you want to talk about, about this? Okay. Um, some of the databases, as far as resources that the teacher would like to see, is you know the main thing is enriching the classroom lessons and supplemental to instruction. This is the the word cloud you use, is that what you call it? So this is pretty much all the responses that came from all the teachers and it just grabs like the, the main responses, the bigger, the more that word was said. Um, so you can see here audio books and um, tumble books. So those are the highest two. And this is also as far as uh, what kind of support would you like as far as in your classroom? training, resources, technologies, those were some of the bigger ones. So some of the other survey insights, teachers want more embedded technology professional development during Wednesday in service days. That was, I think 98% of teachers said that. Teachers desire more instructional technology to enrich their classrooms experience. 
and teachers gave rich feedback as far as the word clouds. And I did, I do have some um, handouts that shows all the responses individually that I can hand those out to you guys. And, um, and as I said earlier, the larger the word cloud, the more frequent response. And several software programs such as Tumbleworks, Audiobooks, and among others were mentioned frequently. So in conclusion, our utilizations in the districts appear to be robust with many of the survey responders voicing need for more availability of devices. Core instructional software spent for READ 180 and System 44 should still be maintained. Those are specialized programs. Instructional software and subscriptions spent is to be maintained. What we want to do is still maintain the dollars, but actually look into it finer in the next 60 days as far as what we can cut out, what we can't cut out, and actually see, um, we've talked to like the library, we've talked to the high school, and see what we can do as far as partnering with them. And future technology expenditure just needs to be evaluated as far as going on with the strategic plan moving forward. And financial sustainability of hardware and software expenditures must be evaluated as well. Our next steps, as I was saying, fine tune for the next 60 days as far as what costs can be cut and what we can um, also partnership with other schools, the school district, and as far as the library, and evaluate new software. Some of the top ones that we saw earlier, look into those and see if they can replace some of the ones we want to take out. And of course, embark on the technology strategic plan process as we continue to evaluate current hardware and software. Evaluate existing pilots, Digital Promise and New ZLA. Formulate a technology blueprint tied to the strategic plan. And draft a technology plan by February 2016 to bring back to the board. And update meetings with board every other month or as needed. So I know there's a lot of questions. <laughs> Should we sit the rest of the question? Sure. Thank you, Joe. That's very helpful. Um, so we'll open it up to questions. Maybe start on this side of the room. Oh, let me help you. I just, sure, I'll <laughs> ask just a couple. And this is, um, I think, more just a uh, request for future surveys, uh, a couple things. One is, especially if we're looking at software usage, it would be helpful context to know the potential audience. So when we look at the read 180 numbers, we would expect that that's going to be a really, really low number relative right. to some of the others. Or brain pop. I think that's targeted more toward elementary ish no no two, there's two versions are there two yes. versions see like i don't know so that junior context junior. would be really helpful so when we see the raw number of you know just i don't know it would just to know oh thank you <clears throat> you know what i'm saying because yeah. if we're seeing 40 percent of the respondents but right. you know only 50 percent might actually have access to it so in the board packet that we included we included the breakdown there's a spreadsheet of every single did you see it I may have seen it, but I okay. So it was a spreadsheet of every single software database with a detailed description of what it was, what it did, and who it was targeted for. Mm -hmm. and, but maybe you're. I, I appreciate the the feedback as putting it into the survey too, so it's understood. Like, well, I'm looking actually for the number, so that if we know how many respondents were there to the survey, two ten, two ten. So out of two ten, mm -hmm. if you know forty percent, okay, we're using it, so that's eighty ish. Right. How many? could we have expected of that population to say that right. they were using it, if they were all using it? Right. You know, was it, should it have been 150? I don't have any idea. Additionally, we get usage reports from the actual subscriptions. So we um, also take a look at those. And BrainPop and the three that came out on the survey were the highest usage in those reports as well. All right. Mm -hmm. um, there, I thought, might be some opportunities to drill down a little bit more as well on two of the survey questions. One was about the um, needing more professional development 
And I would be curious what, right? Is it that they need to know how to actually use the device? Is it they need to be shown which tools might be most useful or how to integrate the tools with their curriculum? And I know that's, you know, part right. of what the team does. Right. So and, uh, okay. I'm sorry, I think some of the responses you'll see that's coming around has that information, but as far as putting it together, what percentage of uh, teachers would need PD or things like that? Well, and what, what type of PD, I think, is... So my understanding from speaking with teachers and working with teachers is the PD that they're looking for is embedded, right? So it's not just necessarily the instructional technology team offering that PD. It is, in fact, the literacy, the math, all the departments embedding it within and showing them, you know, as you're going along this lesson, this is some supplementary things that can assist you. So that's kind of the thing. They're looking for that connection piece because it can't just be instructional technology staff teaching, you know, showing them. Sure. Because these, these subscriptions were purchased um, a lot of times from teachers asking for it. For example, Brain Pop. We had an extraordinary amount of people that kept asking and kept asking for Brain Pop. And so that took a couple of years and finally we got it. And we're happy to see that it's the highest used. And we have Brain Pop um, Junior, which is geared for elementary. And we have regular Brain Pop, which is geared for upper elementary and middle. And Brain Pop ELL. So teachers that are using it are, are loving it. So they just want to see it more embedded and purposeful in, in their actual PDs that they're attending. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same drill down in terms of functionality, if that was a barrier. And I, I didn't, I know you gave a listing of what some of the things were, uh, but trying to understand for the people that offered that as a response, which of those categories, and maybe you have that information if it was a you know, battery issue or a log on issue or it just wasn't booting up for some reason um, so that the team would know these are the areas where we need to focus on. And maybe you feel like you have that information, I don't know, but. Well, as far as having that information, as far as our ticket system, we do. Right. But as far as the survey, um, okay. if they didn't put it down as a response or a comment, then we wouldn't know. Okay. Um, and the last thing I was just curious about, for the, I think it was for the functional issues mm -hmm. of the hardware, mm -hmm. you pointed out that drop off from elementary to middle school. Correct. I'm curious what factors you might attribute that to. It's the <coughs> replacement of the MacBooks the last two years. Right. So. The middle schools plus King Arts and Bessie Rose all have Chromebooks now. The, the other th that makes sense, and I also wondered about the iPad Pilot since they, since Shoot and King Arts Arts got new mm -hmm. devices. You know, we might anticipate next year maybe it won't be quite as smooth because the devices will be a year old, and or maybe I'm off on that. Actually, we've had really good, um, yeah. out of like a thousand of them, we've only had a handful that came back for fixing. Well, right, I'm just saying though, if no, next year. it's the same devices next year, right? Because the devices will can Yes. Right, will right. but we have iPads in the district that are a lot older that haven't given us any okay. issues. So I, I'm assuming, that makes me assume that the ones in Digital Promise are, you know, are, 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 are gonna be good for another year. All right. Mm -hmm. yes. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I'm thinking back to the last technology survey you did, and it was two years ago, or was it one year? That was ago? 2012. Okay, and I and I remember the the primary or one of the highest concerns of the teachers were um, was more professional development, more help in the classroom, and more embedded right. instruction. It seems like it still is a concern of the teachers, and I'm just a wanting when we're going forward and planning, we thinking about where we're going to put our resources, it really seems like that human <laughs> part of it is what they've been asking for and we need to address that. And I don't know if that means just redeploying people in, into the classroom or using our, our, some of our coaches to do that, but I just think it's a really important piece that we need to look at because it seems to be recurring from the last survey. I don't know how I we address it. It seems to me that part a lot of this is also embedding in the professional development of the curriculum and instruction leads, right. what, mm -hmm. how they think about technology in their content area and then across content areas. And then what does that really mean in terms of the broad professional learning, which is one of the t many tasks that we have in the uh, strategic plan. So it's, right. um, 
it, it's something that we have to drive in our curriculum and instruction shop, mm -hmm. if I may, um, to be able to truly get to what Patty was saying or Joe was saying, which is that it should be embedded in, right. in the instructional core of the content area. Right. And, and I can address that being part of the curriculum instruction team, and we meet every week. We do talk about these things. And um, this past year, in fact, we've, Jenny, Fred, and I have all pushed in to a lot of PD, where we've pushed in and, and taught some of the like third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade teachers to use Google Docs and how to talk about the Google Docs when it comes to um, relations with the feature article, right? So we've done a lot of that where we're kind of pushing it in. And as we're doing that, we're modeling for our other curriculum and instruction staff. So the conversations I've had with, with Dimitra and Jess and just the team is moving that forward, you know, and kind of passing on that torch where we all have to put our hands in it and all have to help everyone get there. And I just try to help them see it like, oh, what are you working on? Oh, this is a perfect place where this can fit in or this can fit in. So it's just constantly having those conversations. So it is happening more than it did three years ago, and we're continuing that. And I think that this past year, like I said, I've worked with, we've worked with several departments. Jennifer was just at a social studies PD, helping them integrate with their new social studies adoption. Um, Fred and I did another PD for um, elementary teachers. So we're going slowly, but there is some progress. And the talks are happening. So, mm -hmm. I have uh, some questions just about you. I got a feeling that you were disappointed in the, the response rate on the survey. You were unhappy with that? Compared to the last one, yes. Um, was there a reason only to make it one week long that they had to, to complete the survey? Could you um, have made it two weeks? Usually with the surveys, we usually do anywhere between seven and ten days. Mm -hmm. if it's the technology survey, and we've actually sent out reminder emails mm -hmm. a couple times. Um, I know I was bothering Dr. Gorn about to send out again. Um, right. So it ends with the, um, the testing that was going on and we just didn't want to burn. Okay, it. so there was testing going on. During that was my next question is what else was going on for teachers yeah, at that, during that particular right. yeah. I think additionally, on. Claudia, I think if I'm, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, I think also that week, maybe Paula remember, I don't know if that week was an actual week where there was a, held, a staff meeting held. I'm not sure. So sometimes, if you know that also, if there is a staff meeting and you know and they have that time, to, that helps us. But yes. if it's a week where it's not, I mean, it was just timing was very difficult and all of the other things that are going on. And, and again, then, we we don't also want to annoy the teachers where we're constantly, you know. No, and, I, and I express it to my team and, and the survey when we created the survey, it was created with the input of my sta uh, district standing committee, the instructional Te technology standing committee. Before we sent it out, we shared it with people to review it, and they gave us feedback. So um, they had talked about it as well. But I think part of it is the daily routines of teaching. <laughs> just we're at a point where it just didn't well, get to it, everyone. Well, if you were having major testing going on, that could be, I mean, if there's anything else, parent-teacher conferences, right. report cards. And I think that sometimes it's most successful in getting a survey completed if you do it in the context of one of those Thursday right. staff meetings right. or right. a team meeting. So everybody right. said, this is what you're going to do today. For right. this meeting, you're going to fill out the survey. And it doesn't look right. like it would have been that, taken that long to fill out. No, and we said that in the, in the actual email, it's a few minutes. And I think part of it was April was kind of threw us off with spring break, kind of stuck in there too. So it, it was a timing issue. And part of it is we yeah. need to get the results back so that we have time to properly evaluate them and look at them and actually understand it them. It is a trade-off. Unfortunately, yeah. 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, just, can I say something? Yeah. I just wanted to say that, you know, teachers, how many days, Joe, did they have for the, um, the Google Mail survey? They only had like four days, right? Yeah, it wasn't and that long. It was it, about it, seven days. It was days a really short amount of time. And you almost had 500 yep. responses, right? right? right. So I think it's, with the teachers, it, that was a priority. Right. The it's Google Mail right? is a priority for them, just like the calendar um, was a priority. Mm -hmm. for them. And maybe, you know, answering the survey about, um, you know, technology at that time, it just wasn't, it, it just, you know, some of the questions, for example, I went through the list and realized I don't know any of them. So, you know, I don't know how far people got into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, uh, that whole list with Hapara and, you know. And that would be I, new I, since you yeah. haven't been in the classroom. I, I didn't know any of them. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great reason. And I, and I think in the past when we've given them two weeks, it's kind of like a homework assignment. You know, they're going to do it at the last minute. You know, you can give them as long as you want. 
you're still going to get that core people. And if they, they don't care that much, if they, if they have more passion about the Gmail, they're going to go and answer that then. And can I say one more thing? You know, Tracy, about the um, teachers keep asking for more professional mm -hmm. development. And I think they keep saying it in the surveys mm -hmm. over and over again. We want more. We, and you're right. They, they, they don't feel like they're getting it. Right. So um, Google Mail is a good example. We've known since September that we're switching over to Google Mail. The teachers have been asking for um, training uh, and professional development on Google Mail, and we, we still haven't gotten it yet. So hopefully that will be coming. That is coming. <laughs> Um, any, anyone else? I, I just had one last thing. I don't know when this would ever come up again, but um, I, as I was looking at the list, I was thinking of how many free sort of resources I used when mm -hmm. I was teaching that were just on the web, things like mm -hmm. Quizlet or right. uh, grammar, uh, pl places where you can go and, and design grammar things or, or little games and contests mm -hmm. and things, all of which we don't have to pay for. Right teachers can just use and it might be interesting to know um, how many teachers know of these resources and are using them because it's kind of a no-brainer at Quizlet's wonderful kids can make any kind of quiz in right. any kind of subject that they want and it's free and they can play games with it they can talk to each other right. on it and I found out about it from a teacher at Nichols so some of these things just kind of go grassroots mm -hmm. and that's how you right. find out about it but it would, might be nice to sort of know it at this level too do we have a question on that? When they some of the, when they when they talked about some of the other things they used, they did mention a lot of the free things mm -hmm. in that survey. And one of the things with the with the free things, um, Claudine, you know, I've been out of the classroom for a few years. Some of those free are no longer free; they're freemium, where it's like they're free to an extent. Just like, for example, News ELA, it's free, mm -hmm. or it started out as free, and now it's you know when you when we pilot, when we're piloting it at Willard, it's because it has so much more robust quality. Um, they do use Edmodo, which is free, and that's the, like the social media platform that we use. Um, I, I've seen Quizlet being used a lot, um, Class Dojo. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things out there, but I think it would be nice to get a nice collection of yeah. what all those things are, because they are grassroots and they are word of mouth, mm -hmm. and um, that and can free. also be used during <laughs> PD to supplement and say, you know, in addition to these, because a lot of the free are are really good for quick and dirty and just lessons and stuff. They don't have some of the robustness that you need, but sometimes you don't need that. Right. So yeah. Okay. Is there? Uh, do you have questions? Yeah. Jennifer? So I just have. I want to reiterate Richard's point about targeting and sample sizes and audience mm -hmm. in the future. I feel like this um, was a useful exercise, but it feels to me very impressionistic, not very. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to extrapolate where you can go from here right. with this information. Um, I'm also concerned that um, we just don't know, this is not an evaluation of the effectiveness of any of these things. And, and just to be clear, it wasn't intended it wasn't to be about, I mean, we, we talked about this as, you know, right. a multi-pronged yeah. kind it's of a, process. Right. It was it's really it's to, snapshot. Snapshot. it's a snapshot, and mm -hmm. for us to warrant, should we continue to make the investment in these resources, right. um, quite frankly as we are also building the larger technology plan. Mm -hmm. And that's the next question of how that plan is, what's the structure of that plan, how does it get developed? Yeah, yes. and I think we need to have that a discussion at a different, a separate meeting um, uh, on later, but it is certainly on the docket for this year. Um, and, and we're, we're going to start planning that process this mm -hmm. summer also. So it would be helpful, right. at, at, you know, and I don't know if it's in June, at the June finance meeting, right. to come back to that topic of, of the scope of that work and just the design of it um, so that we can, we can discuss that mm -hmm. so everybody's kind of Can I also on just add page. one thing, Jennifer? One of the things that John and I have talked about a lot, actually, and it's one of my professional goals, was the cleaning, I called it the cleaning out the closet of these things. So at the beginning of the year, I said, you know, one of my opportunities, and I talked to Joe about it before, was... You know, we do seem to have a lot, I don't want to call it stuff, we have a lot of resources. And we've never actually taken a moment to say, hey, how are we using them? Should we use them? Do we continue to use them? Why are we continuing to use them? Why do we stop them? And so John, Joe, and I have had several conversations on that, this very purpose of why. You know, not just pay it, not just, oh, it's renewing. It's, it's, renewal's coming up, we've got to pay it. No, we're starting to ask questions. And these are really good questions of why do we need it? Is there something else that's equivalent, that's free? So all these conversations you know, have been held several times and we're continuing them, so, yeah. Did you have something else? I, I do, I was gonna add two things. One, with the free tools, 
I do wonder if there's a place that exists where teachers could today go and just share without having to go through any central right. group what tools they're using and what they're using it for. Is there a way that they can do that today? You mean within the district or outside of the district? Within the district to start. Like I mean, a collaboration place. Yeah, yeah. Just a place a for collaboration. collaboration. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. just to share information. <laughs> that exists in a, so Graphite, do you, do you know what Graphite is? Graphite is a teacher reviewed website, right. an app website. So that's not within district. Right. right. But many teachers use Graphite as a go-to place when they're looking for websites and apps Got and they're it. teacher reviewed. Right. But additionally, as we're moving to our new web web page and um, one of the projects this summer is um, that Jenny and Fred and other people are going to lead, including teachers, is called, it's like a Google, Google Drive workflow, but the purpose of it is to make a site, make a page where it's kind of like all in one and then have teachers help us give input because we're not in the field, we're not there. And so having that project where teachers will be working together with instructional technology, I think will help kind of bridge that gap and open that communication of, hey, what are you using and how is it free and how can we fit this? And then we want to kind of put it out on the web page where it's organized and easy to access. And if you're talking about other things like graphite, looking at that to see how it's vetted. So. Yeah, however it occurs or if it's internal versus external, it just seems like uh, yeah, an absolutely. easy win at no cost potentially. Right. Um, just to be able to share that. Yeah. The, the other thing I was going to mention, you know, where you talk about the technology plan and developing a technology <laughs> plan, which I think is an important slice. And I'm, I think also that as we get more information about some of our curricular areas of focus, like STEM or literacy, one of the components has to be baked in there. <laughs> you know, here's how technology is going to enable learning for literacy and for math or science, whatever it is. And I, I don't know that we've actually seen much of that. And I, your point, Patty, was interesting, just thinking about how we do need um, at least equal leadership from a curricular perspective to really make sure that there, there's that integration going on, so. And, in, and indeed, when we come back in <clears throat> June with a broad scope, it's, it has to start with what are our instructional goals mm -hmm. and where are we going and then how does technology right. inform mm -hmm. and help right. and, and nudge us forward and then what, what else is out there in the technology world that we should be taking advantage of that ties to those goals. So I, I think uh, coming in, we can come back in June with a, a broad scope of, and a timeline of how we're going to do that. Paula, did you have something else? That <clears throat> no, I'm good. And um, Anne or Andrea, did either of you have any? Comments or questions on the technology front? I have a bag. I'm glad this discussion is going on, and I would agree with the of the I'll just make two comments. Can you come up yeah, to come a mic, up. please? No. <laughs> I think what's really important to note about the way the district is currently spending their funds is the breakdown uh, in terms of what is direct instructional and what is productivity software. And right now there's a really heavy lean toward operating in productivity software, right? So we're talking about $86,000 of supplemental software, which every dollar is important, but that's really in the context of instructional software, not a big dollar amount, of which Read 180 and Read 44 are the only truly direct. Because those other things are databases that really, while I'm all for free software, it's very hard to find something free like World Book Online or like Brain Pop, which is a really deep database of experiential learning, right? So I just think we have to note that, and as we go forward with this instructionally-led technology plan, start to think about where is technology in the instructional plan and how much money of our whole instructional plan do we want to spend on technology as opposed to how much are we spending on technology right. on its own. It, it can't be divorced from those instructional goals. And I would maintain as this discovery process goes forward, we need to look a lot more at instructional technology, not supplemental and database, which we should be able to hopefully get from the library or from partnerships with ETHS or really good free tools. So that was just one point I wanted to make about the way the money is spent right now.
Can I ask, what is our spend on the productivity side? Oh, it's in the, is it in? It's yeah, a, yeah, we broke okay. it down. Well, the only, the only the tools right now are the My Learning Plan for the, the teacher professional development. Right. Things like Hapara, which is a Google platform to help use Google better, which is a collaboration tool, which is really important. And the Synergize? last one. Synergize? Synergize, which is a training tool. It's like $35,000. But um, so if we, there's 247,000 on maintenance and support. Yeah. That's one chunk of the right. 425. And then of the 178,000, which is on mm -hmm. instructional software and database subscriptions, right. I think what Andrea is saying is only 86. 86 of that is actually research databases and mm -hmm. pure instruction. So the balance is also productivity oriented, like have Sarah, you know. What, what I was so, curious about, though, is that we, later on when we get to the budget itself and it says that we're spending 1.9 million on technology of which this survey covered 425,000 mm -hmm. only 22 percent of that right. 1.9 so could Leases. we have a little clarification on what the other 1.9 is the leases so right those are the leases right the leases well what about the leases the leases are in this 425 aren't they no 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 no. The balance of the one nine is is all leases, yeah, the, the leases point, and and the network and sh well, there's a person. Come July, there's a payment of one point five for just lease right. payments for the current that we're going to go into and the ones from before. But that's the and then you're left with four hundred thousand dollars. So out of the one point five, we can get you a breakdown of what's being purchased as far as what's being leased. I should say. So I can do that. So I have just one question because it piggybacks on what Andrea said. Uh -huh. The other instructional piece that isn't included here is the EDM, everyday math. Right. What's the order of magnitude of that cost? Um, actually, I had a um, conversation with John today, and he was talking to Jess. It's, it's just one price for EDM, and that online subscription, it just comes with the I software. See. Right. Okay. So, so it's baked really into our, right. our curriculum. Just cost. like the foreign language um, online is baked into that whole cost and all the others subject areas I think unlike other folks I actually found a 33 percent response rate to be fine <laughs> I mean I don't know what the, you know the your right. past practice has been that it had been it's, higher but um, I don't think that's low by any shape of imagination on something to, I think yeah, we were just to Paula's for. point it's you know it's a voluntary at best it's it's an add-on and likely as though is pretty there's going to be self-selection bias in this kind of thing right. where you're going to have those that are more engaged obviously fill it out so if anything it probably overshoots use of those items for the for the mm -hmm. broad universe but that's to be accepted I think in this type of survey so we just have to take that into account um, so so what we are um, just to close off I mean a couple major themes I hear are you know one you know, uh, obviously a focus on the broader plan and driving the, the technology plan from the instructional perspective. Um, I think it definitely plays to uh, the strategies in the strategic plan around the structural frameworks because technology is, a, I would assume, would be a key component of the frameworks as, as well of how you're <coughs> implementing the instructional framework. So I think that it's a natural connection there. Um, continuing to focus on really understanding and meeting the needs of teachers around their professional development needs for technology. So, um, I, you know, if there's any way to further dig into the meat of that and give more color and texture to specifically, you know, if you can meet two or three different needs, what would be the highest priority needs and set that as kind of a target. Um, and then just a, you know, yeah, can I just add um, sure. something? Yeah, most of these subscriptions do not expire till June 30th. And as far as the summer, you know, the teachers won't be using the subscriptions. So we have some time to actually see what's out there and see what we can, you know, cut back on it or replace okay. with other software. So I would ask if you give us an FYI at some point on mm -hmm. what ultimately are the decisions on that, especially after you've consulted EPL and, and the high school. Um, I went through kind of their long list of databases, but didn't have the time or inclination to dig into it to see where the overlap was. But there may be some that are equal to or mm -hmm. better than what we're currently using that we might be able to partner. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And then we'll come back in June with some at least broad scope of how we're going to proceed for conversation here. So can I ask one, this is maybe off Candice, but um, as a new first class user, um, <laughs> so, uh, 
I don't know if we have enough time. I know, <laughs> this is short, but Paula, I don't want to forget what Paula said that um, the teachers have asked for training on migrating to Google Mail. Is there a plan for that? There is a plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you, can you guys speak to that? Just the, the plan had gotten delayed some, but what the current time, timeline right. is. So, um, sorry, I'm not feeling well today. Um, currently we started, um, I did a training a couple weeks ago with, um, John was there as well, the district instructional standing committee members. So that was, should be one person from each school. And they are my early, early adopters. And so right now, after training them, it's almost been a couple of weeks, I'm gathering more feedback from them because as teachers, they see things, they have a different lens. So I've, they've already said, oh, did you know that I'm getting a lot of, you know, some of my parent emails are coming in as spam. So they're giving me all that feedback so that Joe, Mark, and Eric and I can clean it up mm -hmm. and then give it out to a bigger group. So they're my test group. I anticipate having some trainings, mid, well, it's almost middle of May, probably towards the end of May um, after school and then in the summer, the plan is to continue. Our summer trainings are going to consist, basically the focus is going to be Gmail training. And then the beginning of the year. Right, the first couple of weeks. There's going to be training the first couple of weeks of, no, actually I think there's going to be. Institute days. In district, right, on the, on the um, actual first day of school, if anyone hasn't had an opportunity to train <coughs> over the summer, um, that they, can, they will get that training when you come back on one of those two days in your building. Uh, additionally, the training in the summer will be face-to-face -face and also virtually like I did last year. So we will have, um, if people feel comfortable with Gmail, um, if they can go through the training materials that I provided online, they take a, a test, an assessment, they pass the assessment, they get their credits, and then they're good to go. And then we have a turnoff date of first class when first class is going to be literally shut off, and that is going to be... Um, is it August 10th or 11th? Yeah, it's, it's sometime in the summer, an email will go out. And part of the thing is with early adopters, they're gonna be going through, there's gonna be some differences. So if you're an early adopter, you're still gonna be checking first class for your conferences, for your calendar. So, you know, there's a couple of caveats to anyone that wants to be a, an early adopter. So I wanna make, you know, we're trying to get through all those things because there's no way to be an early adopter and have it be, right, you know, be the exact same in, in Gmail. Just real quick. First class is not just going to be turned off. It'll still be up and running. That's a little Sorry. scary. Yeah. Sorry. So, I, yeah. I told you I wasn't feeling well, and I'm like, it could be I the medicine talking. I can see the faces going around since you said <laughs> it. But, uh, but, you know, it, for the earlier adopters, they're going to look, see, they're going to have email in two boxes just right. to start off with. But, you know, if you look at in Gmail, of course, you're not going to go read it again in first class. So that's how the early adopters are starting. And then the emails will still be in first class. We're not going to shut that down for a while, six months to a year. Who knows if they want to go back and get emails or look at only. things that they want to go back to. So it'll still be up and running. But Joe, when, when we decide Gmail, like in the fall, when I meant turn off, I mean like switch off. I mean, first class, my understanding is it's going to be read only, correct? Right. They'll be able to still go into first class as a read only, but their emails will be generated only through Gmail. So is this um, schedule and all this information, which is very valuable, when is that going to be distributed to the teachers? How is it going to be distributed to the staff? It's going to be towards the end of May. But you said you were starting training. Well, or the early adopters are. I, I'm sorry, I was out today, so I haven't had a chance to talk to John. But um, the the goal is sometime in May, you know, just to kind of get final approval of the proposal that I created and then push it out. So probably towards the end of May. So of May. I don't know. One, if I were an employee, I just want that information. As right early as possible and yeah. like, <laughs> like two months ago they not it's not I mean it's an issue that we've been having all year this right. idea that we wanted to get all of the teachers trained during this school year so they'd be able to right. work on it over the summer you know it's going to be it's very stressful for teachers to come back you know the first day of school now and and we're going to be trained on a new email system and it's not just email it's the conferences it's the document you know where i'm assuming all of that is still going to be on first class but i know you guys are said you were going to be building some things so it's just to us it's just really really late mm -hmm. um it's really late i think there's part of this isn't that the board this committee i recall did request pushing because there had been an earlier time frame and an right. earlier schedule for the transition and given everything that was happening. Am I right, Richard, that I'm recalling? We pressed to 
push mm -hmm. it not to happen in the spring because that, that was your original that was your original recommendation um, and we're so, and yeah and we're we were fine with that it's the training that the we wanted board, yeah. right so um, it's also trying to get to the teachers to train them also it's just mm -hmm. trying to get to the teachers to train them right I know right now and and well, one of the things we're talking about <laughs> we've been asking right Paul we've right. been asking throughout the school year right. to get this done during staff meetings to get it done on half days and and Paula so. and, and the conversations have been going on and, and part of our philosophy too is you know measure twice cut once because if this is if we rush into this and just you know go ahead and give it there's so many caveats we don't want to frustrate people more than you know we don't want to frustrate people and so we have to really be certain that this is how it's going to roll out. And just like I said with our early adopters, I'm learning more things that I didn't know with my small test group of my instructional staff team because we're not teachers. So um, additionally, our, our, our people that are coming in the summer and our standing committee members, we're also looking at building capacity in buildings and building champions among teachers so that you know, we're, we're kind of helping them train the trainer and have teachers also be you know, persons of, of I don't say person of interest, but people in their building that can help, right? Because let's face it, there's not enough of us to go around to all the schools, and so we're really trying to build that capacity and strength in each building. Uh, how many uh, trainings do you do during the week in the summertime? Oh, my calendar is just about to get published. It's um, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it's okay. So it's three. Um, we will have trainings in the summer starting July the July sixth, um, three days a week, two <coughs> sessions a day for the month of July. So for, for four Gmail? weeks. Yeah. It'll be Gmail training. Okay. So yeah. I, I know this isn't yeah. per se the topic, so I, I'll, <laughs> I'll fold us down now on this topic. But I would say it for, you know, to get the communication scheduled sure. to really understand what is available to whom and when. And, um, I, you know, especially if there's difficulty figuring out when you're going to get a teacher's time. Um, mm -hmm. And what is left to oneself, right. quite frankly, versus what is what you should one expect to to be able to to be taught. I yeah. guess. I don't know question. that it is if, if you know the answer to this question. But when the teachers come back, mm -hmm. the first days back, will at that point first class be read only? Yes. So to do anything with their email, they will have to know. Right. You think, I mean, ideally, you would yes. already know Gmail, right. how to use it when you first come back. Because I have to echo that it's really stressful to have to learn something new in those first two days. You know, there's so much right. other things you have to do that. And, and one of the things every year we do together, Joe, Eric, and I, um, and, and now John, we get an end of the school year email out to teachers at the end of May that gives them clear directions of, not only shutting down your classroom and what to do, but also what to expect over the summer and what to expect when you come back. So mm -hmm. we're going to be very explicit in that, where it's going to have extreme, you know, really nice detailed information of what the expectations are going to be. So when they come back, they don't come back to, and say, what, how do I check email? How do I do this? I don't know, right? So that's also, we're going to make sure that gets out before they leave for the summer. Because some teachers don't check their email in the summer, correct, Paula? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of them. But, a lot of them might right. be. But there's going to be plenty of opportunity for them to come in and get trained, though. Yes, and for those teachers that don't want to come in in the summer for other reasons of you know, their whatever reasons they have, will know before they leave for summer what the expectations are and what to expect when you walk, when they walk back into the classroom. I think the question we have to call is, what's the best pacing to reach to reach our colleagues who are in schools um, and and when is the right timing for that how much can we get accomplished before the end of the year what's right. realistic over the summer right. and then what's truly realistic in those first couple of days of school um, and then the, those of us can and this is what we're trying to finalize um, to be able to to say this makes the most sense or option b or option c makes the mm -hmm. most sense then paul can you just circle back ultimately when that's decided whether um, you know, make, when teachers are aware of it, just let right. the so, board know in some the, way so that we know that, that when the communication has gone out. And there's multiple processes here. First, it's the team that is working on this to get the final plan. Then it's a conversation with Paula, which we have on a regular basis, okay. so we can at least put that on the table and then to move forward. Just a yeah. last quick question. 
Um, how long is the live training and how long is the on-demand training? Okay, so the live training in the summer is going to be um, our traditional two and a half hours. And in that two and a half hour training, it's going to be Gmail. We're going to talk about Google Calendar. We're going to talk about Google Groups. Basically, um, everything that you do in first class, how you would live in that world. For the on-demand training, it's self-paced. So they're going to have access to the same exact lesson plan that I provide in the training <coughs> with videos and stuff, and then they have to take a test. So it's, it's self-paced. It can take them an hour, it can take them half an hour, it can take them four hours. Depends on what they want or how, how much time they put into it, because it's the same exact material. They'll also have a Synergize too. Right, and Synergize is built in, so they can ask it questions. But um, from what I found last year, we had, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but we had a nice, um, we had over 20 or 30 teachers that did online and got credit online. And they kind of spread the word. You know, because these are people that are comfortable with Gmail, although, I'll be honest, going into Gmail, there's a lot of things that I didn't know until I really dug deep into it. So it was a good learning experience for me. And the ones that want to take it virtually online, I, I, I would say at least an hour. And just since the board members also are going to be transitioning, <laughs> um, I'm sure we would love to get a link to yep. um, that training can, as yep. well. Yep, I can give it to you. Yes, can I, I just... I just have to say, you know, I'm, I'm listening to all these things and I'm thinking since September we have been asking for the teachers to get trained um, and now I'm hearing end of, uh, end of May and I don't put any of this on the tech department, I have to be honest with you. I don't think that that's the problem. Um, but it's, you know, the end of May, now it's the summer, now it's the beginning of the school year. Um, I, I, we don't have an answer on the, the conferences for first class. Are they going to be there? Are they, I'm hearing Google Groups, but I'm also hearing Google Groups is not as good as what we have currently on first class. So I know this isn't a first class conversation or a Google Mail conversation, <laughs> but I just want to say that um, that I, I, the teachers are gonna, the teachers are disappointed. They're they're unhappy with the way things have been progressing and and we'd like to see the tr we'd still like to see training get done before the end of the school year during the day yeah during the work day uh, half day of staff meeting when do we have a half day? we don't have any left okay staff meeting <laughs> the last Did I miss staff a half meeting day? you know i can't well okay right i, I can't at this point produce right. time i can only say that we've been asking for time all year Thank you, Paul. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Can you? <laughs> sure. Eric. Step up, Eric. <laughs> if you can, then come ahead. <laughs> uh, part of Patty's challenge in getting training uh, out to the teachers, I think, at this point, does rest to some degree on our department because there are technical challenges to overcome before we can even hand out accounts to internal candidates, which is necessary before she can build materials that have screenshots and everything else for how it will work in District 65. So yes, you know, perhaps materials could be handed out that are very general, but they wouldn't necessarily be applicable to how it's gonna be deployed here. So that's response number one. And response number two is it's, not always great to train people way ahead of time when it comes to technology yes. because that's, if you don't really immediately point. start implementing Absolutely. it into your right. workflow you lose it right. so it's actually best to train as close to implementation as possible so that they can take what they learn and put it into immediate practice yeah i think i that's a very good point um and all of us who've worked in technology <laughs> know that, that i think that gross. does p call into question you know from a timing standpoint do you do this before school starts, or do you potentially delay it some more? Uh, you know, if you, to give time in the fall for folks, but that's for you guys to take into consideration. I was thrown into a project last July, never done Google anything <laughs> other than search, and um, you know, had to start using Gmail, Google Docs, groups, and all that kind of stuff um, without any training. Um, but had I tried to do it beforehand, right. 
it would have been useless because I would have forgotten. You've got to be in the moment and be using it for tasks. That doesn't mean that no one here should get training. That was a much different environment. So, <laughs> um, okay, we're gonna call that particular part of the conversation and go back to what's before us, which is a motion on the technology spend um, for software. Um, so hearing no more questions, um, the Board Finance Committee recommends that the technology software expenditure update be presented to the full board on May 18th, 2015 as it's presented in the packet, which is effectively to maintain the spend and the categories that are outlined in your packet. So does anyone have a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. So we're going to, just to clarify. Yes, sure. We're going to vote to spend the same amount before we've checked on other resources, like what the high school's doing and what EPL has. We're not going to look into that. We're just going to. And you know, part of the way that I'm interpreting this is we're authorizing it. It doesn't mean it has to be spent. Correct. Correct. So if we find something okay, better. Okay, that makes me a little happier. Yeah, I mean that, because I had the exact same question. Is that a that's, fair statement? Yes, that's fair. Thank you. Okay. Former and we're spending the next 60 days investigating and right. then coming, yep. coming to a decision. So we're authorizing the allocation, um, whether it's spent on this specific set of items is to be determined. And my nudge, given our current economic times, is that if there are products that we're really not using that we don't think we should spend and we don't find another piece that we will not just go off and spend that money. Right. Mm. Are you saying then you wouldn't divert those funds to something else? Or would I'm it be a savings that, to I'm us? I'm saying that uh, that might be a savings for us. Okay. Right this very moment. Okay, so I had a yep. second? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, could I have roll call? Ms. Chow? Yes. Ms. Rikas? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have one more action item. 7.30. We do. Why are there two more action items? Oh, that's an action item? Which one? Lincoln? No. No, I didn't think so. No. <laughs> Um, okay, so the, the last action item is um, the bid for out of district student transportation. Correct. Mary, are you going to? Yes, let, let me just, yeah, yeah, I'll give you the highlights. So, we, the district uses um, taxi service for students with special needs who are educated outside of the district, as well as some students with special needs who are educated inside of the district if they do better in a smaller environment, um, as opposed to being on a larger size bus. So uh, we, we provide cab service for approximately 30 students who are serviced outside of District 65 presently and about 10 to 16 um, District 65 students who are educated within District 65, but again, who do better being transported in a smaller type vehicle. Um, and so that is the type of service that we're bidding here. Uh, we currently do use 303 Taxi and we are recommending a three-year bid for them to continue on as that provider. We do spend right now approximately 500,000 500, a year on services, and that, that, mon that amount has been fairly stable, but it can fluctuate based on number of students and number of locations that we need transportation to and from. Okay, so you want a clarifying question? How much of that is reimbursed? Kathy, what's the special ed reimbursement rate? Special education reimbursement rate, it's pretty high. It's around 90%, yes. So 90% of the 500,000? For, for special education, if we, if we may have students who, who meet the McKinney-Vento uh, qualification for being homeless, and they, they may be transported by cab as well, and if they don't have an IEP or, and with identified special needs, that would not be considered special ed, that would fall under regular transportation. Do you have any idea what percentage of the students that were using taxis for our special ed, so how much of it's reimbursed? Um, probably 90% of that amount, 80, 90% is for special education. Okay. Right. I, I believe it's a very small amount who do not uh, meet that uh, 
a special ed qualification, but we do have a few. So you're asking what's the net yeah. cost to the district? <laughs> and again, that may fluctuate with state reimbursement, Yeah. which is another discussion yes. topic. Um, we have seen, um, as the state has reimbursed special education transportation at a much higher rate than they have ever reimbursed regular transportation costs. However, we have seen that rate prorated slightly through the years. So again, we don't have any new information on what to expect from the state, but we know uh, potential uh, reductions could be forthcoming. We just don't know what they are at this moment. So we, do we know, uh, we know how much special ed re reimbursement we get, but I guess what I'm hearing is we, you may not be able to parse out what is for taxi versus what is for other transportation. No, no. we know um, because the, the bills would be coded with a special education number if it is related to a special education, a student with special needs. So we know that for a bus or for a cab. So that portion of transportation costs we charge to the special education fund and those go on the transportation claim that is submitted to the state and that is what is reimbursed at a much higher amount than regular transportation. We get very little back from the state for regular transportation services. So what I'm hearing is we would expect that 90% of 90% of mm -hmm. this 500,000 would be reimbursed. Yes, unless the state uh, changes how they fund um, or the rate at which they fund special education transportation services. Does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, I think it's a much different conversation if 90% of 90% <laughs> is reimbursed because if it's not, I really want to have a conversation about how to get that number down. Yes, so right. Yeah. That clarifies it for me. Other questions? SUNY, you have an answer. I know, I'm very quiet. I do not have Marianne, a question. Marion, I'm this. sorry I said I'm sorry, I stepped away. The, the, this bid also says that, that, that they still can be late within a 30-minute period. Well, we did negotiate a late penalty uh, for, for cabs that are um, 30 minutes more or late. That was the only penalty um, they would be willing to agree to. They typically don't agree to any late penalties. And just, you know, they, um, they provide cab service for hundreds of area schools and districts. They are... Um, a very large company, um, actually very organized, um, and we have had, um, I would say, good service. We have had some late cab issues that we are working with them on. Other questions? Anybody? I just have, but no one else has a question. I have one question, and that was, um, I think there was a note in there that the minimum is $25, is that true? Yes, they have a minimum uh, per ride charge, and that, um, that is currently in existence, and uh, they're holding that amount the same for uh, this next year. But because of the distance that these cabs travel, often we're picking up a cab aid from one place, taking the student to the school, and then dropping the, ca uh, the cab aid back off. So we are almost always hitting those minimums. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, if I don't hear any other questions, then uh, we'll go ahead and, and put this to a motion so that the Board of Finance Committee recommends that the out-of-district student transportation bid for fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 18 be presented to the full board again on May 18, 2015. Um, I so move. Second. Roll call. Ms. Cho? Yes. Mr. Rakes? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Now we get to move into the discussion part of our evening. Um, you may have thought we were already there because <laughs> having such good discussion about the other items. Um, so I think our first discussion up is our update on the Lincoln Storm Water Project. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Candace. We have uh, Tom Richlick uh, here with us again. He is a civil engineer with Gewalt Hamilton. They are the civil engineering firm that the district is using on the Lincoln Storm Water Project. And they happen to also be the civil engineers used when the stormwater retention area was uh, built and designed. So Tom has been working diligently on um, getting specs on options, getting ready to go out for bid, and he just received some new information today, I understand from the city, on, uh, that could affect cost slightly and has another alternate to propose. So Tom, do you wanna um, kind of go over what you have there for us? Mary, you introduced everything I have to say, but I uh, appreciate that anyways. <clears throat> so I think it, 
Most of you that are familiar with what we were talking about here. Do you want to sit at a mic? Yeah, can you sit? I can sit. Point? I'll have to chop up and flip pages. That's fine. Yeah, just so that people uh, I should realize I could have gone big screen, but um, so I, I just flipped to the, the the base plan of what we're looking to do here. Uh, nothing in the big picture is really new. We've got uh, perimeter fencing in, the, in there as an alternate. We have a track perimeter right up against that fence as an alternate. Uh, we have a primary base bid, which is a large concrete, uh, prefabricated concrete vault, which will be the replacement for the open stormwater basin that's there now. Uh, the new turf grass will be a natural turf grass underdrained and with an alternate for an irrigation system. The, uh, um, and the general picture from what you're seeing now is a depressional area. What you're seeing when we're all done is go from sidewalk to the <laughs> fence on the other side, roughly a percent pitch across, so to the normal human eye, flat. Um, what we, during the course of our design and with just the cost uh, popping back out at me today. We got our bid information of all of this contract documents that you're seeing here and the technical specifications that support that to Carl Gatz, who's our uh, uh, landscape architect and coordinator for the bidding on Friday um, and then have been trying to, in advance of this meeting, get a handle to make sure that we have not exceeded our projections from January. Um, we are probably a little high between our review of the MWRD's current w, uh, watershed management ordinance and the city of Evanston's requirements. Um, our calculated stormwater detention volume that we're creating is just about uh, 5 to 10 percent higher than what we had hip shot in January. So, um, so that, and that being a cost driver for the project, right now I'm, we'll call it I'm hedging. My opinion of 630 grand in January up to in the 660, 670 range just to account for this cost. What we are looking at as a means of mitigating that, as you, uh, as I presented before, we still are looking at the, the tunnels of fun option. So uh, it probably doesn't look like much if you're not used to seeing uh, engineering plans, but these are all. Uh, three and a half foot diameter pipes that run north south from Lee down to the existing drive. What the, the alternate here is a potential cost savings of about 10%, which hopefully balances our whole scene. But we are in the process now of getting our permit through the MWRD. If they approve this, fantastic. And what we're, a lot, what we're setting up to do is we're bidding this as an alternate, so we're going to kind of let cost make it some decision. <coughs> if the MWRD approves both, we could just do whatever is most cost effective. Um, both would serve uh, the district, the school district, and the city and the MWRD adequately. Um, so that's one way we're hoping to mitigate that cost extension. So. But uh, I think other than that, the only thing else that I've talked about with Mary and Don since our last time we met was considering the investment we're looking to put in here in order to have uh, regular heavy use for PE. I've suggested a uh, fifth alternate to the entire contract for a year long of aggressive, kind of aggressive field maintenance that you would see at a Glenview Park District soccer field or a, you know, along those lines, the kind of stuff that uh, um, the parks and, and colleges, Northwestern does these kind of things, right? Deep tine aeration, turf slicing, fertilizers, and a program that runs three or four times a year. Uh, considering we're going to put this sod down in a hot time, we're looking to put it down in August. We're going to have an irrigation system as an alternate. If we don't award it, we're going to you know, kind of be pushing on Don and, and the staff at the facilities committee to keep it wet and keep it growing. Once that is established, it's very easy to forget about it and burn it back into the turf, the brown turf that we can we see what happens. So I've been suggesting, and I've included it as an alternate to job. Again, we can let cost drive our choice. And I'll be here to present that on the 8th. Uh, we are opening bids on the 2nd of June, as I, I check back to the schedule. So it um, gives me a couple days to review all the numbers, make sure the contracts are in order, and then have a clear recommendation to the, uh, for both the packet for the facilities committee and a um, presentation in time for the 8th.
And as we've uh, talked before, um, we're planning to have the recommendation come to the Finance Committee on June 8th. And because this is a very time critical project, um, the board has decided they would convene a special meeting after that Finance Committee meeting to vote and approve on, on the bid so that we could get started very quickly on the Lincoln Project and not have to wait till the end of June for the typical board meeting. So every, every day is critical. Um, to have this project done or substantially completed uh, before we have students back in the building. So just a reminder of, of that. Every week counts in June. June's a great time to build things. So we could give up weeks, three weeks in January for the same week in June, right? So does anyone have any questions about process, sequence, permitting, contract? We're, we're in the process for the, these are on the street. They were published last week. Uh, so it, being a public project, it's open for any qualified contractor. Uh, we set qualifications for that work. And um, so typically at this time of the year, our challenge is that a lot of them have filled their schedule for the summer, but those that haven't should be hungry. So, you know. Folks have questions? Question about oh. when, when you came earlier, we were all concerned about the permitting process, the timing. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, is that flowing well? It's flowing well. It's the best, best civil engineering term I've heard all day. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I ever used one. Well, That's, uh, I think you should use it more. Right? <laughs> uh, yes. Engagement and flowing well. I'm good. We've had, uh, we've had uh, reviews from our, our plans that we presented to this committee back in February or March. I did go over those with the uh, uh, head of permits of the MWRD and Ingrid at um, the city of Evanston and then have subsequently sent in plans for permit review prior to the bid release and then have updated them with these bid release plans. So these are the ones that we're looking for them to approve, uh, but have kept them appraised of our design along the way. Um, Ingrid gets it. She understands that this is accelerated. The MWD doesn't like doing that, but they're going to do it. Um, so it was very nice of them to kind of help us along. Usually they don't want to see it until it's stamped and sealed for construction. Don't bother me in the intervening time, so. Not that I could blame them. But. The folks have questions? Tom, could you um, say again the number of alternates? I heard perimeter fencing. Yes. Um, the perimeter walk track. Mm -hmm. And then irrigation, am I missing anything there? Is the, so this uh, tunnels of fun mm -hmm. pipe option yes. is an alternate. So it would be a replacement to the prefabricated concrete vault um, in the, the way that there, it's reason it needs to be an alternate is there's elevation differences to how I can construct a pipe system. And so I have to construct more storm sewer this way. Uh, it changes a little bit of how the structure is. So I, we have a whole sort of separate sequence of this is alternate number three. It's a long way to say that that's number three. Number four is the irrigation system, and number five is the turf enhancement process, okay. which would be uh, in the contract, just to be kind of specific, in the contract there's two months of uh, operation. So the contractor is required to mow the grass within the project. It's his, so, so if there's initial problems, it's his to own up and fix it right away. Um, there is a clause in there that as soon as Don and, and Tom are ready to take over, ready to take over. So school starts and you want to kick the contractor off the job. Turf is good, you guys can, can come up. Uh, the extension is so that in November, when we're ready to put this turf to bed, uh, one of the best ways is to feed it more nitrogen. Um, and so that would be number one. And then three, three additional applications during 2016 that would help ensure this aggressive growth. Uh, the uh, goal being is you're gonna put sod down, it's about three quarters inch of topsoil with grass on top. You really want that root system to penetrate through and into the growing medium we're going to create above our detention system. That helps that knit and prevent even elementary school children from tearing it apart during this. Typically our design is high school football for that, you know, 10 people pushing against each other and one guy running around. This one's a little easier, you have just 100 people running around. So, yeah. Thank you. So we'll look at that and then we would be able to look at all or any of those independently. All right. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mary. I think that was a great update. We will look to hear specifics at the next finance meeting.
and Mary and I will clarify what the dates are where decisions need to be considered and then made. So we'll be explicit about that for the board. For Just the yeah. Okay. But we were expecting we would be making a decision at the next meeting, at the next finance committee meeting, June 8th. Yes, because right. that's when we're asking for a board vote right after the committee meeting so that we can, you know, approve what, what we're willing to uh, support as far as the project goes and get moving um, on it. The timeline is, as we said, is very tight on this right. project, so. Um, likely, if we award it on the 8th, we can go to work on the 9th. Contractors will be that, at least be starting to mobilize and set perimeter fencing. And start, there's not as many holes to dig as it's already a hole. <laughs> Just so you know, June 9th is our last, last day of school. Day of school. <laughs> we have students all day, so I do not want huge equipment <laughs> on site. I don't want, you. you know. You can think about starting. Uh, prepare. Okay. All right. Let. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to item seven, the state financial update, and maybe we can flow that right into the budget update after that. Um, okay. Kathy, are you? Kathy, why don't you start, and then we can also do a quick overview of what we heard this morning as well. Okay. So we, uh, we continue to monitor what's happening with the state. We have some good news for you tonight. Um, uh, we previously reported to you about the cuts 2.25 that affected our um, uh, state revenues. Uh, luckily, District 65 qualifies in state's view as distressed um, school district because the um, number of cash days on, on hand is under, under 180, only 73, and our financial ISB rating is uh, a warning, financial warning. So again, that was another qualification for hold harmless provision. And be because of that, we, only, we will only lose about 58,000 of the initially projected 222,000. So that's the good news. So, so the state did a 2.25% reduction writ large our original thought was it was going to be a two hundred twenty-two thousand yes. dollar reduction because of the old harmless. We're we're back at fifty-eight thousand. Fifty-eight. Uh, another uh, piece of good news is that we uh, we have received all uh, entire allocation for this year from the state. Um, um, we were very concerned uh, because we, 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 we had um, a meeting uh, in which there were some state representative, uh, representatives that, that VESPA to be specific and she was not sure if the third um, state payment will be received. It was received. We got the money so it's, it's also um, good news. Um, That's still at the prorated amount though? Or um, still not at well, the this, this state aid was um, received at the prorated amount. But again, the entire amount that we're going to lose spread out over several programs. It's only 58000 yeah. so I just wanted to so, mm -hmm. you know, just messaging again that when we say we receive full amount of monies, that still is a yes. prorated amount. Yes, it is a prorated receive, amount. So Absolutely. We're not receiving the full amount no. of money. We're, receiving we're not what receiving we budget, which any. Is at the prorated mm -hmm. amount. But there is still a lot Correct. of. That, that indeed. The 100% of the state funding that we should receive, we receive approximately 85% of that. Correct. So we're Correct. already down 15%, Correct. even though we budget yes. accordingly. Um, Dr. Boyd, um, do you, do you so, want I mean, the, the only other uh, um, input, uh, Candace and I had the pleasure of going to the Evanston Chamber of Commerce, <coughs> Commerce legislative breakfast this morning with. Uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky, Senator Biss, Representatives uh, Fine and Gable, and Commissioner Sufferden from Cook County. Uh, and they offered this pretty much the same news. There's a, we're in a period of about 20 days of uh, the, the state deciding on its uh, budget for the year to come. And that, uh, that sort of political conversation is going to go on in Springfield and will yield um, they're not quite sure what will, what, what will be yielded unless there is a raise in taxes in some ways, in the income tax. And so that sort of negotiation, they haven't heard the details, so at least in the public forum we were in, the details of how that will work itself out uh, wasn't clear to the legislators. They, 
they said that they had full hope that this would work itself out and we will move forward. Uh, they talked a lot about the potential wealth that the state of Illinois has if we were to, uh, the, the panel there, if we were to tax at a higher rate at the, the income level. Um, but they, they were very uncertain as to what the resource flow would be to the broad public agencies. Um, uh, when asked, as one of the questions, what about the impact on K-12, uh, they repeated that the governor has said that K-12 will be funded, uh, and yet the colleagues on the panel who represent us, uh, Evanston and that slice of Skokie that we represent, said um, that they're <coughs> very concerned that even if the education stays funded at the 85% level or or whatever level, that the support services that support our families and our children will be cut in some way or form. So that will have an impact on the schools in an indirect way, but really a direct way if the social services for parents, family members are being cut, if um, health services, if mental health services, if job services, et cetera. So there was, um, Candace, I'll, I'll, I'll turn over to you, but I, there was um, a lot of uncertainty um, and then knowing that something has to be done in the next 20 days. Yeah, I would think that was the most anxiety for me because it seems like it's an entirely opaque right now. Correct. Where almost they're waiting till the very last minute and then a series of things will unfold. So while the general thought was something like SB1 isn't getting much attention now, it could very well at the very last minute. So we have to be even more vigilant around being on top of the, the things that we care about because it will happen so quickly at the very end. And so that's anxiety raising, so <laughs> I think in general. Did anybody bring up Browner's proposal around a property tax freeze? Um, they mentioned that it was, you know, it was out there uh, and that certainly would impact education and, and the municipalities and um, and so, yeah, I think there's the, the messaging is that the direct education budgets even are, you know, are okay, but there's so many other moving pieces that would directly and indirectly impact education that it doesn't mean that it's okay for education. So um, that was our takeaway. Something can still happen. Yes, and, the, and in, with respect to the Supreme Court's um, overturn of the pension, Bill, there wasn't really any discussion around what happens next there. Um, so I, I thought perhaps they would talk about what the next plan would be um, to go back to the drawing board or what have you. Or if costs will be shifted to the local governmental authority. I mean, and, and they didn't, they weren't explicit about that, but I think we still have to be on our toes. Yeah. There's certainly a higher likelihood that that shift would become more imminent. And try to become more mm -hmm. minute, so. And can I just clarify what we're talking about? The pension cost shift is what we're talking about, and that was a part of pension reform, which was that the state wanted to move some of that pension cost shift back onto local school districts, and we were initially given the estimate of possibly 2% of certified payroll would be what that cost would be, and the state would phase in that payment half a percent a year, you know, half percent the first year, one percent the next, one and a half up to two percent. And we uh, were told to plan, you know, to plan for that cost shift. So we have in our financial projections cost shifts going up to two percent. And it, it is believed by EDRED and IASBO, the Business Managers Association Group, and others that the cost shift is a very likely outcome of this failed pension reform because there is no constitutional guarantee about what districts would pay. So they don't picture that having the same constitutional challenge that the pension reform did. So it's possible the pension cost shift could be very real. It also could be very large. Um, so that's something else that we are monitoring very closely with ears to the ground. Yeah, I think Senator Biss made the comment of, you know, should a pension cost shift, there's a way that you can do it, which is the gradual piece. It very well could be something totally different than that, should it be part of the grand bargain, if, you know, so. So there are a lot of moving parts, and yet we don't know what those moving parts are. And, and again, I think the, the, the way they, re, they reported, the, they may not know either until the last moment. So there you have it for our state finance update. Um, do you want to move into 
the budget update, and I think if there are any, we have as an FYI, FYI the additional materials around budget reductions. If there's any questions about that someone wanted to raise, why don't we have to do it here as, as we're talking about the budget update anyway, if you have them. Um, you mean as we get to them or in advance? <laughs> Uh, as we get to it. Okay. Like, not right now, but just so we'll couple it in with this since it's the topic. Um, so, Kathy, are you? Sure, yes. I, um, I would like to give the committee a brief update uh, of the budget. Uh, work on the fiscal year 16 budget, um, of course, started uh, back uh, uh, in um, February, January with financial projections. Um, I am currently in the process right now of incorporating individual um, uh, 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 budget requests from individual departments for individual programs. We have implemented a new methodology this year, zero-based budgeting, which um, basically means that program directors for all non-personnel expenditures and for some personnel expenditures uh, were required to um, justify those expenditures, basically. It, it, it wasn't what we um, previously did, basically, you know, um, um, they were not starting with any numbers. I mean, it was basically a, a, a blank sheet, a, a spreadsheet, uh, of course, but, um, and, and I think it, it did help um, several of, of our program departments to even, um, you know, understand their budgets, go, go through uh, expenditures. So that's what's being done right now. Um, assumptions used for um, financial projections are being uh, reviewed, they are being analyzed, uh, several are becoming facts. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we uh, use in our financial projections, we used 5% for health insurance. Uh, well, the final re renewal is 5.1%, so very close. Um, there are still uh, employee, um, employee uh, salary cost is known, will be known, because fiscal year 16 will be the fourth and the final year of the employee contract. So these amounts um, are known. But there are still several unknown, including cost of transportation. And um, we, we should know something uh, later this week, but we are almost uh, certain that the actual cost will be higher than what we have in our uh, projections. Um, there, was a there was a question about um, uh, what we use for salaries um, in uh, subsequent years. Uh, we have been using 3.8%, but again, this is, this is just a placeholder, um, and basically uh, it's a cost of step and, um, um, and, and track. Uh, on the revenue side, um, we um, property taxes, our largest um, uh, revenue source, will be increasing by the CPI for calendar year 2013 of 1.5 percent. Um, and, however, the, the final amount of the levy uh, extension and the new property will not be known until August. Um, CPPRT, we're waiting, of course, for the state. We're waiting for them to finalize their budgets so we can, we can um, uh, finalize our estimates in our budget for categoricals, for general state aid. Uh, information for federal uh, grants is trickling in. Um, district has received a tentative decision for the Head Start grant, um, approximately 2.7 million, which is substantially more what we currently have. We, we get about one million. Uh, this is um, tentative, so I mean we don't have a final letter awarding the grant to us, but we will, of course, we will keep you posted. Um, draft tentative budget will be presented to the committee next month. Tentative budget will be presented to the uh, committee and the board in August, and then the final budget um, will be, uh, of course, presented to, to this committee first. Uh, usually we do uh, changes. We show the changes between the final budget and the tentative budget, and then will be voted on in September. Um, there is one table that's attached to the memo, and it um, just summarizes pre um, a previous cuts. Um, we went back to 2003 and um, they are grouped into non-personnel and personnel uh, categories and, and, and you can um, check the amount of the FTEs, um, again, reductions, um, staff efficiencies um, in five years. 
And one point of clarification on the potential Head Start grant. So we just heard as we were going to press the possibility that we will get, we had applied for four point something, 4.3 4. 3 million. They came back 2.7 .7 million. Um, and indeed the next question is what's the, um, what's the net gain for the district and does that help uh, offset some other costs? Um, we're not sure yet is the answer because we haven't seen we haven't seen the resources coming in, and by being the overall manager of these uh, of this program, as opposed to being a recipient of the funds, we're going to have costs embedded in that grant to be able to to administer that. So that's so there'll be some net gain, if I can call it that, for the district, but we don't know what the number is right yet. Mm -hmm. And there is always a matching cost. So I mean, I mean, it's right. we, we can't all of a sudden start charging everything. I mean, there's we still. Uh, need to be paying for some of the expenditures, even with a larger allocation. The and there's still, a, a, you can hear uncertainty in my voice because this is a tentative, quick notice, sort of like a quick email notice. So we don't have a confirmation letter. We don't have the, uh, the, the full details. Not written in stone. Yeah. Not written in <laughs> stone. Okay, questions? Claudia. Um, a compliment and a question. The, the historical and projected budget reductions chart very informative and useful. So thank you very much for putting that together. Um, the FTE reductions, I wondered if those are net or if those are gross. Because I, I, yeah, I would assume that every year we also added some positions. Right. Right. And so yeah. these, you know. These are only reductions because every year we, we, um, we add for student enrollment for programmatic changes. Exactly. So these are not in, and I would imagine would be probably hard to get, we would need to involve HR department <laughs> if there is a need to bring them to this committee. Um, oh, okay, because you knew what I was going to ask us, could you yeah, do that? If, yes. Very hard, okay. Very, very hard because they, they may not have that data year by year for various groups, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's not like they have a chart before and after and, and, and um, yeah. We, we did have that discussion and it's not, um, it's certainly not easily accessible and it may not be accessible at all. And I suppose the other thing we don't know either is um, if we don't know who, then we also don't know if, like, what jobs were taken away or reduced, whether they were like, let's say they were all low paying jobs and they were replaced with a fewer people, but higher paid people. So we might not have saved any money that way either. But we probably don't have that. Uh, well, we have some information, but I don't mm. think we have complete okay. picture. But Thank you for what you did. It's great. I, I can tell you, I know for certain in the in the uh, custodian and maintenance department because that's one that I oversee. Mm -hmm. We had six custodial positions that were vacant through the years, and we just didn't fill them. And it was done to address previous bu uh, budget concerns. Um, it was done uh, to help balance those previous budgets. So we were down six custodians before coming into the recommended reductions that will affect us next year. And again, those are all through attrition, so we did not have to lay anyone off. It's two more custodians and two of our maintenance uh, folks. Okay, thank you. I think that would apply to several administrative positions. We used to have um, several assistant director positions. They were never refilled. Um, they were just so eliminated those numbers or those salaries would not be in the budget, would they? No. If you knew for sure you weren't going to fill them. Yes, correct. Yes. I mean, that's how we balance yeah. our budgets. Yeah. <laughs> and any changes that I've made upon my arrival have been at a cost-neutral level from last year. Is that right? Yeah. Richard? I did have the same question that Claudia did in terms of the numbers being net or not. Um, it is interesting just because I was looking in particular at the instructional staff line and although about two-thirds of the reductions occurred 12 years ago, which I think is really important to note, you know, that in more recent years we have not made, they account for a smaller portion of that total number. Um, we can probably assume there that with the increase of about a thousand students in the last few years um, in the district, that we've seen a lot of those positions return, right? Yes. Is that a? Yes. I yes. don't know what the number is, but we know it's going to be some something significant. 
Yes, I, um, I mean, especially if you look at a scattergram uh, for uh, debt members, I mean, there, there is a net gain every year despite those reductions because of the student enrollment. And I know also, I think in line 12 for special services support, would that include um, special education TAs? Is that that where those individuals would yes. be? Yes, yes, correct. Because we, I know we reduced some of those a couple of years ago, so probably the FY13 reductions, and yet we we hired some back because there was a need, right? Correct. So yes. mm -hmm. um, I'm just using those as examples that, mm -hmm. right, it's, I understand that it would be a lot. Um, I think when we share this, if we do at some point in any other format other than sharing it with the committee, that we would just want to highlight some qualifiers to say, you know, some of these have returned as the student population has grown, or as needs dictate, we have, you know, added on for special services support, whatever would be appropriate. We should annotate that. And yes, I would think. I don't know. I know it may be difficult, but over the long term, as we continue to look at budgeting, I would think even at some aggregate level, we should have some point in time, I don't know what point in time it is, but as of January 1, as of August 1, that we should know how many employees we have, right? <laughs> at, within various categories. Not necessarily at this, perhaps at these individuals, but, you know, central office, building administration, special services in general, instructional staff. Um, if we can't, if we don't have that capability today, then that probably is something that, you know, our budget task force and our team should be looking at how we ensure that. Um, because then we could at least at those, at a very high level, look at the trajectory of total staff over time and see how it compares to these reductions. At, at some level, you could see the direction, directionally how they're flowing. Um, I had I had one other question um, just about the reductions in 03 does because it was so significant and 40 instructional staff does anybody know the context of historically the context of that for 0203 yeah for those reductions? yes I think it was drama that was drama it was, was the it? K2 yeah. drama and I believe it was some of the specials some, a lot of the specials, mm -hmm. middle schools. Uh, we used to have this program that was called Caribbean uh, program, t two FTEs. Um, I mean, I, I do, I didn't bring with me, but I do have details uh, for I was just curious staff. whether it was a focus on. I just on remember the biggest flap was over the K2 drama. The drama. Mm -hmm. right, and they remember. did cut it. Which we've now added back, right? So, <laughs> and it's been very well received. <laughs> the last few years. Was it sixth grade foreign language too or was that? Oh. I, I feel like since I've been in the, or was in the district for those 11 years there never was a sixth grade. Sixth grade. I think I started in 2001 so okay. yeah. And I was just going to ask a question. I noted that the the benefits for the staff reductions have now been included in this, in the attachments for this finance committee meeting. Mm -hmm. So there's an additional $430,000 in savings, it looks like, from that. And I'm wondering how that fits into, is that counterbalanced somewhere else? How does that fit into the decisions around? It's not additional 400,000. It's approximately uh, 193,000 for benefits. Okay. Um, it's page uh, 120, 125 in the FYI. I had to, I did say if you have questions about this. It's 1934 right? Mm -hmm. um, well, part of the savings will be used to offset additional benefit expenditures, and I um, mentioned it at, at the last meeting. We, um, due to um, uh, Affordable Care Act uh, requirements, we have to provide um, insurance to additional employees, hourly employees now, and our HR department is actually estimating, um, you know, how many how many employees will have to insure, and and that that that's going to involve additional cost that was not in projections. 
um, and it's going to be a substantial cost. Kathy, can you tell us what benefits are included in that? Because on a proportional basis, it actually seems quite low. It's only 12.5% of the total right. compensation package, and I realize we don't fund all of TRS, but is TRS in there? No. It is not. So no. tell it's us only, what is in there. Um, what's included is only health and, um, and dental insurance. Okay. All right. So from a definition of benefits to include pension retirement, just so folks know that this is not the full inclusion of, of that, um, that amount, because it typically and, and would be actually higher the, as Yeah, and actually the percentage of the TRS that the district pays is charged to salaries. It's not part of the um, benefits because, um, because of the contractual agreement. So is it reflected in the salaries line? It's, it is. It yes. is? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So, so those salaries are not direct salaries. They're whatever the direct salary is plus our portion of TRS. Is that true? Yes. No, these are actual benefits. And the reason why these benefits are vary uh, is because some of the um, employees um, did not have, did not use our um, 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 uh, medical insurance, uh, or we had some uh, vacant positions. But the question is on the salary line, is that salary and TRS put together? Yes, yes, okay. yes, or IMRF. Or IMRF. Mm -hmm. so I'm just, I, my computer is about to die, but I noted a difference of about 1,600,000 versus 1,170,000 from the previous projections about staff cuts. Am I looking at the wrong things? Well, it does have a total of 1,6, but it only says 193, so. That's the question is what, whether the math is off. Um, because we have additional, um, the nec next uh, additional costs included in the under salaries. In the previous table, we reported only net cost, 195. So that's why you have this additional line, line 10. So it, it matches. Th there was a request to show yep. full savings. Um, so that's why you see 435.75 and then a deduct versus 195. Okay. I'll look at the I think again. the question okay. is in column, so the total is 1,599,000. Mm -hmm. You would think you'd take the benefits out of that at 193. You don't get 1.1 million. So mm -hmm. one of those. If the I, I have to double check. check. Yeah, I'll have to check my, my, my formula. Okay. So if you can just check and confirm that. It, it looks like, based on the benefits numbers, that the 193000 is accurate. And I was actually, I just looked at the salaries number, or the so total and the salaries. I'm sorry. I looked at the total, and again, I'm sorry, my documents no. aren't. <laughs> attachment C from last time compared to what the total personnel savings are listed as now yes. look to me to be a difference of four hundred thirty thousand dollars. Well, the, so. there definitely is a difference because we aren't using the net number for okay. reading specialists. It's the full salary which we had asked for, so okay. that's higher. That's four hundred thirty thousand. Okay. So that would make that would account for that. Difference. We can double check these numbers and clarify. Yeah, you can come. Yep. Thank you. And I guess my real question then is, if there is some additional savings, does that does that you know that wasn't anticipated? Is there really, or are you saying that other costs are, are raising so there isn't additional savings? Does that cause any reevaluation of the cuts that have been made for this year? Well, benefits, be, the benefit costs can fluctuate day to day depending on who's on what plan and who jumps on, who leaves a plan, who goes from single to family or vice versa. So we did not show benefit savings because we know we, we, we are going to have some unemployment costs to absorb where we have had to let um, staff go, and those are not shown in the projections. So we, we are being conservative, and not and that's why we did not show the benefit costs originally. Plus, uh, we, we expect to have some additional costs related to the Affordable Care Act that will impact the district um, expected in this next year. I think the, the short answer is we did anticipate that there were going to be additional costs mm -hmm. and that the, the benefits savings here would be absorbed by those additional costs that weren't otherwise projected already. And then the, the, the question you're not 
really asking, but um, but it is part of this is that we're also looking in the out years. So we're looking at what the reductions would be for this year and then thinking about what that really means given our projections over the next three or four years. If there aren't, are there any other questions on this topic? Okay. So you'll get back to us on whatever the correction would be there if there is a correction needed. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. The 235 line item, I think it is. Under salaries. Yeah, I think, I think that it's just, it's just the salaries totals off. Right. The so line is, 10. Mm -hmm. So not that it's something that's. Yeah, this is a total. I don't know that that's. Additional costs, hasn't carried over. Well, we can um, clarify. Huh? Okay. We're going to move on to the future budget task force. And Paul, I think you were going to give us some. Let me just kick off some of commentary in addition to the memo that we. Well, let me <coughs> let me think of let me think out loud about and provide some background to some thinking of what we would like to recommend um, in moving forward. And this the budget task force starts with a couple of the premises that are in the strategic plan, which talk about increasing stakeholder awareness of the budget challenges, and effectively communicating our short and long term. Uh, budgetary needs or capital needs and our financing needs and indeed as we reflect on this year's budget uh, uh, construction and then mo want to move forward to next year and the out years as I was just suggesting mm -hmm. um, what we want to do is we want to promote transparency and be um, as deeply engaged around this table and within the community as we can um, gather input um, from community members and move forward to gather um, insights and some ideas of, uh, of, um, of the, how the community and community members will actually look at our, our budgeting process and the guiding principles that we have and the options that we pursue over time. So what I, um, and I, I know that several of you have asked, you know, what would a, what would a, a citizen's budget task force look like um, and what would it do and what wouldn't it do? I mean, so what it would look like is, um, in some ways, uh, in my mind, I would see reconvening members who served on the strategic plan finance committee or some of those members, and then having a task force that was perhaps eight to ten people, a small group that could serve as, um, uh, as uh, our citizen assisters, I think is the best way, to, to provide input, to look at the options, to give us critique on our guiding principles, um, the, the question several have asked is how deep would they go into uh, financial planning and analysis? That depends on timing, but I think the, 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 for me it's the, um, it's the assistance to look at the guideposts, to, to, to help us with the guideposts as we actually determine um, uh, how we move forward on constructing a budget for the year to come. How would we uh, convene this group? We would actually, I think, start with the, um, uh, with, with the financial sustainability planning committee members or some of those members and then with the board president and the finance committee chair on behalf of the board think about who else could serve on that committee and then that committee would actually meet I, what I would in the ideal world I'd love to have that committee um, appointed sometime May June so that we actually have colleagues who are ready to work with us and then we can start on our tasks of pulling together information that's necessary and then August, September, October, November, or probably September, October, or early November, meet three times, four at the max, um, again, because we want to make sure that we have time to do the work, and that during that time period, September through November, we would also engage in what we did in the strategic plan, some sort of town hall meeting, some sort of reflection um, with broader community members on um, again, what I'm saying is here's the, here are the guiding principles, here are the guideposts, here are the suggestions, here's what the, um, the budget uh, task force has actually given us as, as advice. Get some feedback from the community so that when we move into a November, December period when we really have to construct next steps on the budget and as we have a conversation about the potential for referenda, next steps on that, that we have a, a fully informed process informed by community um, uh, both at the task force level and at the broader community level. So the, the broad base here is to uh, convene a group who has um, 
who has the ability to look at what we're presenting and to offer suggestions and um, uh, to move us forward to, to work in the community through, again, a town hall process um, and to make sure that when we um, head towards late in the fall that we've gotten community input into the processes and by that point we'll know a wee bit more or a lot more about what the state is doing and a lot more about our financial condition. Um, so that's a kickoff and I don't know, Candace, if you had other uh, thoughts. I'll, I'll come back to myself. <laughs> Tracy. Two questions. The first is, will we put out an application process like we did for the strategic plan and the last budget task force? Is that part of the plan? Um, sure. I haven't gone that far to think about the, okay. I mean, I was, start, I was using as my starting point the, the members yeah, of the strategic exactly. plan force. And so, yeah, I think it actually makes sense to have to people to express interest. And we want to uh, we want to make sure that, at least in my mind, on the on that committee, that we'd have people who have a certain level of expertise in budget and finance and mm -hmm. public finance. Yes. Um, it was suggested, I think Jennifer, in, in some notes, that we have perhaps somebody who understands the grant making, grant seeking, um, in the, both the public and the private sector. Yeah. Um, so I think I think we could we again i don't want to absolutely default to the, only the members of the financial task force but there's some very good members of that ta task force mm -hmm. and i would assume that they'd want to come and join I, and then i think the second piece of this though is that it's a it's a dynamic between a small group eight and then a larger group the community where we mm -hmm. would really reach out into the, yeah. into the community the second question i have and i've i've mentioned this before and i because the size of this committee doesn't sound like you'd want to want it to be very big. I think that we really need to talk, have teachers talk about where the greatest impact they feel the dollars are and where they think there's waste or where we could cut. So I would love to see a teacher task force or some way uh -huh. to engage the teachers about the budget. Um, and that not only teachers, but administrators and staff, because I, I really believe they could help us on this. Yeah, and so uh, the, the, that's a really good suggestion. And whether it's a teacher's task force or whether it's several well done focus groups that are done mm -hmm. even independent of us, I mean, we would have to yeah. think about how we stage that. But I, I, to get that, I mean, again, in the in the developing the voice and the contributions of the broad community on the strategic plan, we did systematic outreach into schools. We did systematic outreach with our principals. We did it with our. Um, <coughs> Um, with our community members writ large and then a very focused uh, work group. So how we can actually stage this in a doable way. The, we're constrained, the only constraint we have is that September, October, November is when we should be doing this work in an intense way given budget preparation and other key decisions that the board's gonna have to make. And I also think that engaging the broader community comes later in the process. Well, I think the teachers so, and this ta a high level oh, task force would be really the first stage. And you, because the task force is essentially the community. Yeah. Um, because you, I think it would be too early to go get input about cuts from everyone when we don't know what the. Well, and the, and the, the what would be helpful for me is that as we, attempted to communicate guiding principles during this budget year moving forward. I think those guiding principles is what will help to, uh, we want to engage the community and our internal community, our staff members, um, so our teachers, our administrators, um, and the external community on where, given, given constraints, where, where should we and how should we look? And I think we can propose that and then see what sort of feedback we get. I really echo both of Tracy's comments. I think those are great. I think it will be really important for us to just be clear on what the, the goals are. And for me, that drives us toward having people who are, in my view, um, wanting to have people who are experts, deep experts. And I, I think you know, the teachers will provide a really important perspective. But if we think about the goal, it's how do we, I'm trying to think what the right language is, but it's essentially coming up with solutions. It may not mean cuts. Cuts may be part of that. It may mean increases in revenue. 
through some sources, which was part of what the last task force looked at. It may mean shifting, so not cutting or increasing, but shifting in some way. And so I think we just want to be really clear as that as task force the, is yeah. convened what the board wants as the, the outcomes so we can be abundantly clear about that. Um, I do think we have to be thoughtful, and it sounds like you will be, Paul, how we separate. So I think those deep experts would have one charge to dive down, and I think getting input from the other stakeholder groups, like the teachers or the broader community, if you talk about a, something like a town hall, I, again, be clear about what we're expecting from each group and what we would actually do with that those different sets of information uh, because I think they could all inform some of our choices but they might be really different um, in terms of what we get back. Yeah. Oh and the other the last thing I wanted to say was maybe we look at some of the members from the task force that was convened three or four years ago because they've already got some some footing and at least some of those people have stayed engaged in the conversation so we might get a little bit quicker result or deeper result if uh, some of them were present I think at one of, at least one of the financial stability task force members was also on okay. the previous citizens task force um, Elliot I think was, but so I think both was, those teams was, both right. the more recent strategic planning task force and the one from a few years yeah. ago probably would, could be good candidates. So goals, processes, and clear communication is a key piece of this as well. Um, I would actually go a step farther, I think, reaching into that the 2011 committee makes sense. But I would say, looking at the 2011 committee report, uh, a little bit over a year ago at a board meeting, we got that report and sort of the responses of, of what actions were taken um, in response to that. And, you know, certainly a lot of, of action was taken, but there were also a lot where the response was, there wasn't a response. So I don't know if that means that action wasn't taken on those suggestions. Some of them were that, you know, negotiations had to take place before any change could be made, um, you know, certainly on like salary structure type of, of suggestions. Um, but I don't know, since then we have gone through a negotiation, I believe, so I don't know if anything happened with that. So I would say even using this report as a very good starting point, because I think a lot of these things, I and mean, there were some revenue generating ideas that I don't know that we really pursued. Um, there's no, need to totally reinvent the wheel when I think we have a lot of good suggestions from this report that I'm not sure were entirely acted upon at that time for whatever reason, but maybe now we can push a little bit more on those. Um, and then I know we are going to be talking about referendum and, and what we need to do with that, but um, it, it, you know, I, I just think that that also has to be, you know, as we're discussion, discussing ways to cut or generate revenue and, and, and deal with that. I think there also needs to be part of the charge at some point has to be where are we not wanting to cut? Where, what are the, our values in terms of we don't want to you know, increase class sizes, whatever the case may be, cutting arts, cutting drama like we had to do many years ago um, so that we can start to inform if we decide to go the referendum route so that we can really early on starting to inform that process as opposed to waiting till October, November, and then saying, okay, now that we have this feedback, let's get started on figuring out what that question or what that ask is gonna be. I think that speaks to um, Paul's comment around principles, you know, guiding, guiding principles, principles, which is right. somewhere that you have to think about how we get the board's input on what those should be as we set you know, set kind of the parameters for the task force, or at least some bounds um, with some core guiding principles with, uh, with input from, from this group. Because um, that will drive what the potential consequences are and options are. Correct. 
Yes. Yep. Um, so I would just suggest one that you make sure that you do outreach to new people because I can think of one person who recently moved to Evanston who's like a finance expert who's done great things who might be great for this task force. Good. Um, and I, I just wouldn't want to miss out on the opportunity to bring in some new ideas. Um, so I think it's important to do that. And then secondly, I think I would strongly recommend not waiting to engage the community until after this process has gone through. I think that you may find that the guiding principles actually vary from site to site. And so I don't know what the structure would look like that would best work, but to have each school community, teachers, administrators, and then also parents look at what are the the highest value things in their school that they would not want to do without. Um, and, and I think beyond that as a district, making sure that we're prioritizing the most vulnerable kids. So making sure that that's not just about like, that's what, you know, 60% of the school wants, but that's all the affluent parents or whatnot. But looking at who are our kids who aren't achieving and let's make sure that we're serving, that all of the decisions are rooted in serving those students well. Um, I just think that there's a lot of ideas and maybe difference, differences in what could be effective cuts that could come from the schools themselves rather than a high level task force, you know, the, the decisions, they may not be thinking about things and to think about how can we do things creatively across sites and not, you know, we, there's not that much room, right? There's not that, we've made a lot of cuts already. So we really have to get creative and be looking at revenue and how can we do things and share across sites, et cetera. I just had to respond. The reason I said that is that I think it's, tremendous if schools want to have PTAs get together and talk about these issues and give input to the district. But we just embarked on a strategic planning process that took up enormous amounts of time for the administration. And I would hate to our, for us to set them out on a similar task for six months to do the same thing because there's so much work to be done. And while it is wonderful and we do want input, that's a, uh, that's a huge amount of administrative time. So that, that was my feeling. At this point, we don't have that time to spare. Um, so my first like initial reaction like when I saw the uh, agenda was that I was wishing that the revenue discussion came before the budget task force just thinking sort of tactically about how these things move together and that you exactly do not want to bury staff in processes that then don't actually match sync up um, so that's one comment about it gets to SUNY's point is how do how does the conversation about a referenda, whether it's operating or capital, fit into whatever deliverables come out of a budget task force? Um, and then, you know, with all due respect, you know, thinking about school by school cuts, when you're talking about the size, the number size of the deficits going forward, I think there's a conversation I haven't heard yet being an observer of finance committee meetings of what the actual levers are and what kind of sophisticated modeling has to happen right so you can do a town hall meeting and that's important to do for community input processes but without knowing without being able to tell the public what the major levers are like your choices between class size increases contractual changes you know cutting full swaths of programs. I mean, there are only a few things that are gonna come up with $10 million. A discrete set. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's not really a little bit here, a little bit there, because that's pretty much already been done. So to get that on the table, honestly and transparently, quickly, can get you to a referendum conversation and then a counterfactual conversation of here's what District 65 would look like without a referendum. And that's why I think these things have to, like, I would hope for everyone's time's sake that we're really thinking tactically about those two things 
in tandem and thinking, as Richard said, about what pieces of information you want to get from what audiences. Um, I think that's right. It's, may I respond? I mean, sure. I think the, the, it's, it's very helpful to think about the levers that we can possibly pull given the constraints that we have. And, that, um, and indeed, to self-criticize, the levers we pulled on this current budget were in small, they were significant, and they're, they're very significant to the school communities where, uh, where the pain is felt. Uh, but they were smaller levers to sort of set up the longer process. And the question is, how can we, how can we go back to the uh, budget task force from a couple years ago that had several recommendations and use that as a starting point? That's, that, that was sophisticated analysis. How do we then look at what's real across the board in the district? And I look at Kathy and Mary because we can look at the, the resources. And then how can we shape out a couple different models of what we would have to do if the if the cuts have to be in certain ways. I think the, that's the process that we would then present to uh, um, a committee to be able to give us some of their expertise to our um, teachers and principals and staff to be able to hear them out and then to figure out how to actually get the parent and community engagement as well. Um, and, and again, Tracy, I appreciate it. The, uh, the thinking about how we would do this in an efficient way in the next in month and a half to set up the committee, then we've got summer and then we get rolling and then we've got to make some, some pretty key decisions as a board and an administration in November basically, um, uh, early December at the latest. So, so to set that up, how do we actually get the feedback that we need? Great. And that's pretty, like the end of that process is pretty concurrent to decision to put something on the ballot or not put something Correct. on the ballot. Right. I mean, that's what that's we're driving to. Yeah. I mean, I think effective, I mean, I would say effectively, this work needs to be in September and October. Right. Because Otherwise if it bleeds. August. August. I was September, October. Well, August, September, October. But I mean, this hard stop, October versus November, because then it's got to go into, okay, what does that potentially look like? Mm -hmm. Right. In terms exactly. of the, con the, you know, the options. That to drive us to a decision on referendum or not. Exactly. And, I, and I do think, Paul, your point about how we, we get parent input somehow will be important um, to your point. You know, and, just, and I just want to be clear that I'm not just talking about parent input. I think building level input, teachers and administrators, is yes. critical. Right. And I, I, think, right. I think, yeah, we had, Tracy had already said that, and I think there's agreement around that. I do think one thing that we as a board will have to pay attention to, though, is we um, we can't change you know necessarily what one school wants versus what another does. Like if one school says we're not committed to drama, but we as a district offer drama, you know that's like a, a district wide curricular choice. And you know if one school said we're willing to go to 30 kids per class, and the other schools aren't. We can't allow that one school to just go to 30 kids per class. So I, f I feel like while I, we need to get input from every school, a lot of the choices, the levers that are going to be pulled have to be pulled at a district level. Um, it's not to say that there aren't some school level levers that, can, that couldn't be pulled, because I'm sure there are, but a lot of the ones that I think we're talking about are, are district-wide choices, and I see your face is saying something, but I'm wondering what words I, are there. What my face is saying, I work for the Illinois Network of Charter Schools, and so the idea, you know, this is just that that it would have to be district wide versus site by site just wasn't doesn't. I'm thinking, hmm, that's that's what's coming on. But because what just if you play it out, for example, if um, let's say some schools decided to get rid of music. So if you wanted to have music as part of your education, you would want to like move to a school or there'd be lots of requests for permissive transfers. Or if some school said, let's, we want it to be bigger and I'm not, their class sizes to be bigger, excuse me, then you might have people opting to go to the schools where it's smaller and so then your demand decreases at other schools and I would say that's inherently why there's a charter design and there's a public school yeah. education that's different. And, yeah. um, and you know, we part of our core values are attendance neighborhood schools and 
providing an equitable experience. Not that it doesn't mean that certain resources aren't deployed differently at different yes. schools because we want to make sure the neediest students mm -hmm. get yes. the, what they need. But part of that equity is making sure they both all have the same quality experiences in education. And so, so it's just a different, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, somewhat different approach. <laughs> and I am just explaining why my face looked like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what I do think, what I'm hearing is that, you know, there is a piece of looking at the value, as we, we have to distill the values of our school populations into a hierarchy that then says, okay, we believe after looking at, you know, what folks have said in these individual school communities, what are the core values and what are the strongest values that, that then ref get reflected in the principles that we put out uh, to make these decisions. Um, so I think we're hearing you that we need to take that input, but we have to then look at them uh, at the macro and level. And yet, and I don't know all of them, but Jennifer's point is really well taken that the, those levers may be fewer rather than greater. I mean, that, that when you actually think about what is a two and a half million dollar reduction over the next five years or three or four years to be able to get even, um, that the, the lever to pull across the district in an equitable way uh, may only be three or four as opposed to ten. Right? But even like if you eliminated the entire suite of assistant principals, you're not going to get there. I mean, those are like you, you need to have that modeling down to know. Right. Well, and when you have a budget budget that's 85 percent yeah. personnel, we, we obviously know there's limited places that you can look. But within that, what is the right way to go about it? I just make two points. Yes. So having sat on the Financial Sustainability Committee, committee, I will just echo the point that I think at least getting a good mix of people who of people who are already up to speed, because the only way we can really help that, Kathy and Mary is, you know, to accelerate their efforts at this point because of the time is so short. So of course, new voices, but just get a core of people, leverage the existing report, which was good, but it wasn't looking at things in the order of magnitude that have to be looked at now. So I'll just put in a second pitch for, to me, by the end of July, if we don't have a common set of transparent information that we can get to the different stakeholder groups by August 1st to start to learn about, we're going to just be behind. Because still, I think you hear people having conversations, even about the most recent cuts, not even understanding why they were needed. And as much as I know this group communicates and thinks they communicate, we have to, I, 10 times. People have to hear things 10 times before they re it really sinks in. So for example, a year by year over the last three years, spend per pupil, benchmarks against our peer group, benchmarked against the state, some measure of efficiency of spend, some idea of what happens if we increase classroom size by three pupils, it starts to give people a common vocabulary. So when the teachers sit down, they're going, oh, wow, you know, this is how our district is described in financial terms and in qualitative terms. And the parents are looking at the same thing. And the administrators are looking at the same thing. Because otherwise, there's going to be 20 different conversations. And it's going to be very hard to have a common conversation about what needs to happen come Octo October or November. The second point I'll make really quickly is that as a taxpayer and a parent, which I think most of us are, I always wonder what's 202 doing? And are we going to introduce a conversation about a referendum at the same time 202 is considering other plans for either cutting or raising money? And people have kids in multiple districts, and they are looking at the big picture. So I think coordination with 202 over what their plans are is pretty important as well, just from a community conversation standpoint. and a we don't want to confuse people or double whammy them with good news or bad news. And, and if I may, uh, Andrew, your, your, uh, thank you for both points. The first point is why I recommend that the board president, the finance chair, and I sit and we'll come up with some sort of process, but move as fast as we can to engage people, but also to appoint that task force so that then we can get some of the asks that we need to do in the summer months so that we can be up and running. And, and we have a lot of this information anyway. And it's the question of how to package it and then how to communicate it and start a communication process. And then my commitment has to be to be uh, uh, clearer than clear on 
on what we're doing and how we're doing it and what the timelines are and just to repeat that five, six, seven times. Ten. Ten. <laughs> well, in summary, um, <laughs> I think we have a, kind of a fast track to deploying this process. Yep. Paul and Tracy and I will convene separately to speak through the <coughs> details of the application process and how we get it get that moving and then um, and and solidify the goals and kind of scope of objectives based on this discussion um, so thank you all and as we do that again based on the last conversation we're in a roller coaster based on whatever happens at the state and uh, over the next 20 days over the next 20 days property something. Cap. <laughs> right, yeah. yes. hopefully there'll be no freeze um, all right, thank, thank you. you all. So the last discussion item we have for tonight is um, the referendum discussion. I'm going to open this up um, because you know some folks have talked about there's these obviously um, parallel activities that are going to have to happen. Uh, the reason last September we had had, well actually start, I think we started in August at Finance Who Meeting had um, started the discussion of potential referendum and in September um, based on a couple, two primary reasons, I believe. Um, one, what, uh, one was just the lack of uncertainty around, we were talking about potentially capital and or operating, their, the lack of information about what we were dealing with in terms of the size of possible deficits in the state situation, uh, as well as secondly, um, the strategic planning process was initiating and we really wanted to um, talk about these types of cuts in the context of what are our strategic priorities, because that too informs what the principles are, you know, um, so that we can align um, our look forward into whether we need a referendum of which flavor or not based on what those strategic priorities were. were. So if I'm summarizing a lot of conversation that was around that September meeting, I think those were the primary reasons that we decided to not move forward with um, further discussions of referendum at that time. So we are reinitiating that conversation tonight, reopening it. Um, this will be step one. And um, what, we, what I'd like to do is there are some materials that Mary or Kathy can um, point you to in the, in the packet. I'm sure you've all read them. Um, but I'd like to try to focus the conversation tonight on um, not what would we do with referendum money, <laughs> Um, not should we, making the decision of, obviously we're not ready to make a decision of any reasons as to what we're going to referendum, but talk about uh, what are the criteria that we think are critical in determining where our biggest need are in terms of making an ultimate decision of if we were to go to referendum, should it be capital or operating? So trying to focus on that part of the conversation first, um, not at all committing to if we say we believe you know, and what information do we need to make that decision? Because we're not going to make it here tonight. But um, uh, so opinions around, you know, based, we do have some collective knowledge around the capital referendum options and the operating options. We have some data in the packet around what the impact, taxpayer impact would be potentially of both of those at various levels. And so I'm just looking for your thoughts and opinions on. Um, on how we go, how we go about choosing one other, neither both, <laughs> and um, what other information we need to to get to that decision. Does that make sense to folks? To frame the discussion. Okay. So, do you, do you want to provide any overview? Or I could. If you well, I think we all. I think the good. biggest the biggest part of biggest part of the overview is that a decision would have to be made by uh, what was it December early December mid-December mid yeah formal and, board vote a formal board, board vote correct and the attorney is actually recommending that that vote happen in November in case there's a snowstorm in case there's something that comes up where we can't get to an early December board meeting so I'm just going to pass that along we had a meeting with him last week okay <laughs> Just to be clear, that's for the March ballot. March 2016. Yes. November 16 ballot. Which, this would be, which would also be in the presidential primary season, correct. not primary. the presidential mm -hmm. election. election. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I don't want to necessarily commit, we're not talking about timing, timing. but that would be the earliest that we, could, we could do this. Um, so does anyone want to start with either? Is there any question questions? about whether the biggest need is capital or operating? 
well, I think there's a there's always a okay, so that that is the question. What do you all think? <laughs> I mean, we have clearly we have a $92 million backlog in capital. There are lots of capital right. projects, um, but we do have a plan in place at least for the next eight years on some vi some vision there on what we would do if we didn't have a referendum and how we would move forward and what we could get done. But you can't backfill like if you say just hypothetically if you do the capital referendum you take those things off it's not like then that solves the operating deficits right so that's no, the, there's no there is no the, right the there's only no, potential mm -hmm. so the only potential transition that we have discussed and it needs some further discussion but if we were to, to transition the technology expenditure out of the capital budget and into the operating budget yeah. that ranges anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the overall capital annual capital expense right now if you were to push it into operating, and you'd obviously have to fund it in operating, but that would free up some funds and capital to do the actual, some more facilities. It used components. to be in operating. In operating, we really moved it over. It should be. It should be. It should be. Yes. I have yes. a hard time with, like, um, a least item replacement. So, um, so that's something for a number of reasons we're talking about. There's economic financial impacts because we're paying double interest effectively now, and um, and then other you know other reasons that that could be a shift. But we would have to fund that out of operating. Otherwise, there are separate discussions. There's separate pots of money. Uh, to your one of your questions, just before we get into the discussion, capital referendum is for a certain time period. Operating is perpetuity. Yes, correct. Into perpetuity. Mm -hmm. right? correct. So. And there's so there and as you look into the financials in here of what the impact would be, certainly an operating impact is more considerable right. on the taxpayer than a finance than a capital. It's way more expensive. Yeah. Even though yeah. Which is probably why we haven't had one in a long time. Didn't you say it was an operating? Operating. Though we haven't ha held an operating referendum in I, I seem to think it was the last time we did it was like 30. This building was 2000, I think. This building was no, built. That's, 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 that's what I'm saying. Yes. That's the last. Yes, that was the last successful referendum. That was a capital yeah. referendum. Yes. And, and by the way, that, that um, referendum purchased a substantial amount of technology from uh, that fund, which aged over the years and needed to be replaced eventually. But yes, and it did pay for this building. If my memory serves, so I think you said it was 30 years since we'd even tried. You know, I am checking. I, I've yeah. actually asked our bond attorney and our bond uh, representatives to see if they can find when our last operating referenda was. I believe there was a referenda for a tax rate increase, but I don't know if it actually increased the taxes. So I, they're researching that for us. So I guess that's one thing I, to, I would like to keep in my mind is the fact that it would be a very unusual thing. And maybe, and then we'd have to decide how well received. But uh, the other point I wanted to make was that on the operating side, capital things are, you know, they're concrete. And people could say, oh, yeah, new roof, I could see that. The operating, it's kind of like those funds help us realize the visionary kinds of things that we want to do. I don't know, professional development or programmatic changes or whatever. And You'll never get to do those things if you don't have an operating referendum, I think. That's what I'm afraid of, that we'll never achieve some of those more, maybe to me, more exciting. Although I think a new roof is important, too. <laughs> you know, about the roof, we, um, we, there was a question about, you know, does King Arts really need all those roof um, replacements, yes, they do. The roof over there is about 25 to 30 years old, and roofs only last about 25 to 30 years. So once we do replace a roof, um, you know, it's going to last a good 25, 30 years. And what we did, which is part of our eight-year timeline of abbreviated, you know, projects, we took the King Arts roof replacement and we spread it out over multiple years so that we could fund it within the debt service of what we expect would be available. So we do have a plan for addressing the roofs and every year the architect, the roofing architect comes out and reassesses to see has this, you know, taken priority over that one. So we, we actually do have a plan and um, I'm confident that we can manage, um, you know, based on priorities through that debt service. So. Which would mean there, we wouldn't need a capital 
assistance. Is that what you're I, saying? I, I, we have an eight-year plan for um, getting by without a capital referenda. Jennifer, were you going to hey, make you, some comments? The other question, you said, what other information do we need going forward? So one question I have on, on the math and on the modeling side is, so you've done your projections out to 2020, I think, or 2022? 1920. Um, so the, there's a question about structural pieces related to like contracting and the salary structure. What's to say that five years out you'll have another hole? So Oak Park did an operating referendum, I think three years ago, and now because of state finances, they're in the same position about figuring out like whether they need to go back for another operating referendum, operating referenda, are more expensive than capital and hard, you know, sometimes harder, less, they're less tangible. Right. Um, so I think that so if someone could do the long-term math, like would you have the same problem? Well, I think part of the thing you're pointing to is we talked about the fact we have a structural issue right now right. in that our, our CPI, which drives the taxes, rises at a much lower rate than what our primary expenses are and that 3.8 percent or four percent roughly in personnel expenses us going to referendum isn't going to correct that um, it might correct it for a while um, if that's what you're getting to but it doesn't necessarily correct it for all time um, so and that's the so they are two separate issues and that's the unpredictability of it all i mean in some what in some ways what what we had counted on in doing the projections for this year is a CPI of 2.0, and it came in at 0.8%. Mm -hmm. So that's out of our control, but that actually is the control lever on how much we can uh, gain in terms of our tax dollars. I would say, you know, in terms of information, one thing that I do think we need is we need some understanding of the sensitivity of the budget to half a percentage difference in CPI just so we start to understand that. So, you know, if we're projecting 2%, every half percent, what does that mean in terms of, right. uh, every, any half percent lower, what does that mean in terms of additional, you know, uh, additional debt or costs that we're incurring? Um, because we, we know that we're highly sensitive to it, but I don't have a feel for, you know, what that degree of sensitivity is. Um, so it's just one thing as we're thinking about these, these these impacts yeah. and how we would look at operating referendum, um, because those are always that's always going to be unpre you know, less predictable. Um, Jennifer, did you have anything else? Boy, everybody was so talkative about technology expenditures. We get to reference. <laughs> <laughs> that's because they were specific and immediate. Yes. <laughs> um, I would think on. I mean, I would echo, I think, Andrea's point on the operating side. I think the sooner we can get information on, um, you know, I love that August 1st deadline. I don't know if that's doable, but I, I think that that should be the goal um, of what, what are we talking about? Like if we don't have a referendum or, you know, don't increase operating revenues, what does that look like? And, and what would we be, you know, what kind of class sizes we'd be faced with and that sort of thing. Um, on the, the capital side, I think we need to have a very similar understanding. I mean, I understand that we have, you know, sort of the, the uh, you know, out to 2023, what projects we could do. And so I guess implicit in that, that is what projects we can't do. Um, and, you know, looking at, at which schools are, are, are going to get work, what kind of work that is. Um, you know, it also doesn't take into effect, into account things like the Lincoln enrollment issue and how, you know, we are in the short term, you know, trying to get people to transfer to other schools, but those other schools might not necessarily have the capacity. Um, you know, like I'm thinking we're trying to increase magnet school uh, transfers. And yes, we have like the King Arts roof, but you know, Desi Rose is a building that is K through five, that is housing K through eight, and there's no plan for Bessie Rose in here. 
Um, you know, there are a number of schools. I, I just think a similar discussion of what are we talking about? Not what the small projects that can happen, but a very clear understanding of that means that in 2017, these are the only projects we can do. And, and when people are coming in with, uh, you know, and I don't know how many projects like this come in, but I, I hear from people a lot about, you know, come into our school, like, you know, we have ceiling tiles that are falling off and the carpets look terrible and really need to be replaced. And I, I don't know how much of a kind of a slush fund we have to, to deal with those sorts of things or if not at all. But an understanding of those kind of basic maintenance type things aren't going to happen if we don't increase our, our capital revenues. So I would like to have a greater understanding of the kinds of things that aren't going to happen. And just, you know, as a reminder for anyone who's listening in, and maybe it's worth at some point in the conversation dusting off, although it hasn't probably gathered a whole lot of dust, is you know, we looked at the 90 plus million dollars worth of projects and we broke them into priority mm -hmm. groups. And right. we said if we go out for X amount of dollars, these are the ones that would be funded and these are the ones that wouldn't. Yes. Um, so, you know, that might be a really solid starting point to just go back and review that. There might be some things we need to add to it, but I think, it, I don't think it was a year ago. Uh, when it was in when the, was it? Was it? In the it I believe is it. it in, I think it was. Um, okay. I don't. I don't know if 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 what you're talking about is in here. We have the the capital the master spreadsheet of the projects, and then we. But TMP. What you're talking about is the TMP report, and I believe it was in the last year. I don't remember exactly was, when yeah. we last had the conversation, but had we like did have the ABC option. That was in August. Think. That was the August. Yeah, we, we somehow grouped them into priorities. Right. We, we, so can, we, said, uh, we can send that out in the, with the June packet if that would be helpful. I, just as a, a point uh, of reference, it's, you know, probably needs some tweaks, but because it was only a year ago. Well, I guess a little bit what I'm hearing, and I, I think from, a, from this overall transparency and communication, we do need more of a high level, almost like a two by two, which says capital, you know, with, without, <laughs> operating with without not down to the very detailed but the order of magnitude types of things that couldn't happen or would happen right. and and use that as a way to frame frame discussion externally but using that document as a source but you know lift it the up level, a couple yes, levels i totally agree as our, I, I do it as three two because i do do nothing like i think you'd have to have that in that, that well, what was that, Jennifer? I'm sorry. In in Candace's matrix, the do nothing too, like the. Well, I think that's without a referendum. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's without right. the referendum, what would mm -hmm. what would it sorry, look like? I missed that part. With potentially, what would it look like? Yeah. So with on the capital side would be secure entryways, right. air conditioned shared spaces, accessibility, gymateria. accessibility, yeah. gymaterias. <laughs> I mean, not that all those. You come up with seven. You know, seven's probably too many, right? But you know, it would be a really, we could make it a small set of categories that would be easy to communicate, plus several plus other things, but it might account for half or three quarters of right. the work. Just to be a lesser, I mean, just yes. to shape the conversation. Totally agree with that. Um, um, sorry, Tracy, yes. I think also it would be important to see, and I don't know if you all know this, but what our operating um, deficits would look like if our CPI was tied to our in our contract to teacher salaries because it it's important to know what part of that is structural and what part of that is something else that because those are two different categories in my mind. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think I think that in some parts relates to the just the difference in if our CPI projections are off too, how, because that's an additional risk, you know, in what we've already projected, right. knowing what that risk is, yeah. but then and, attaching it to. And I do know there are other public education districts that actually have that built in contractually. To our high school. To a two, two, two does. Two. And yeah. Oakton Community College. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon. Yeah, right. Okay. Um. There's another, again, this perhaps is for down the pike a bit, but 
there's a question of is it possible to run two referenda simultaneously and what the success rate would be or is it better to run one referendum and and then do the, another one later on and uh, and I think we just need to we need to pay attention to what other districts have done and and look at the, the logic behind what that would mean I had gone through the data for the last five years and there was only one district that did both went for both they failed both of them failed um, but that's out of a pretty large number of referenda that are you know attempted <laughs> and then um, so I don't think it's so that's a statement unto it's, itself it's right. not frequent and it right. was not successful at least to that one data point of over a five-year period because um, I went through IASB's reports for the and last indeed, five years this goes back to Andrea's good point then not only what the high school doing but also what are the other taxing entities in, in our township doing and indeed if there are state ramifications that causes the city and the other taxing districts to be able to uh, and as the as the city is already doing multiple plans on what would happen if there are dramatic reductions on uh, the state support of the city services, I think we just we just have to be cognizant of all that. Well, and there's some commonality, um, not to get into <clears throat> possible changes, but one of the things in the previous task force was around TIF. Um, we, collectively with the city we could do a TIF expiration if the, if they needed that benefit and we also needed that benefit an early expiration I mean, so there's there are things that collaboratively right. with them could provide additional benefits for the new coming mm -hmm. <laughs> new world coming on and we have been working with the city Bill Stafford and I and uh, on a, a, working on an additional TIF surplus payment and actually the city does benefit when there are surplus payments when there's enough money built up in a TIF that money goes back to um, taxing districts including district 65 district two and the two in the city has a benefit there so we have had conversations on that front the TIFs that are out there uh, we do have some rolling off with the 14 levy there's a, a small one um, there's a smaller one rolling off in the 16 levy, and then um, the 18 levy is a larger one, the Washington downtown TIF, that's a big TIF, um, and expected to be very successful. So those numbers are now uh, in our financial projections as far as the, the roll-offs. And the other TIFs are very young, so they don't have, you know, there's a lot of TIFs that just started. Some are kind of upside down because property values fell after they initiated them. So wouldn't be candidates to really not, not the later ones okay um, if there are any other questions there were just a couple things as we were thinking just to point us back and we can continue this conversation the next time around criteria or principles um, as we're trying to make you know I think to your original point Claudia um, at the core of this how do you make a decision for capital or for refer operating um, a few things I had thought about is obviously at the center of this it needs to be impact on student learning like so what what there are capital impacts of student learning right um, there are also operating impacts of student learning we could use that as some of the central organizing impact on the thriving workforce strategy so you know to the extent that how are the type of environment we want for educators and for them to do their best job thinking about that as a frame of reference um, community support obviously is another component where do we have where we have support and through this process, figuring out um, where support is lies. Um, obviously, the re the burden, burden for the taxpayer. We've got to take that into consideration, um, and then likelihood of success. <laughs> so, I mean, those are just broad strokes areas. But as to think about as you know, not necessarily principles, but to to kind of. Um, be foundational as we go through making these thinking through the decisions between these two types of referendum or or not at all so if you have others like that please bring them forth okay so the next meeting is going to be June 8th 2015 um, it looks like we will have a number of exciting topics on the docket including um, a little more scoping out of the technology strategy plan for the coming year, the budget, the draft budget, um, stormwater project actual bids for approval, and um, potentially some more updates on state funding. So those are the ones for certain, mm -hmm. and I'm sure mm -hmm. there will be other things. 
So, um, unless there's anything else to come before this, oh, should I read this? There are no other further matters to be presented to the committee. I find this meeting adjourned at 9.06 p.m. Thank you.